This meeting is being held remotely as an alter means of public action, access pursuant to chapter 20 of the Act of 2022, temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. Does anyone on the meeting want to uh, wish to record the meeting this evening? Okay, seeing none, uh, I do note that the first item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Joe and Liz, you ready to proceed? Ready. Yes. Right, I'll take a motion. I'll move to approve the minutes dated August 16, 2022. Second. Motion made and second. Is there need for further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by roll call vote. Joe? Aye. Liz? Aye. Now I'm in the eye as well. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda is a joint session with the Hingham Municipal Light Board to interview a candidate for the vacancy on the Municipal Light Board. Uh, the candidate we're going to interview this evening is Mr. Jonathan Bullman. So I see my colleagues, Laura and Michael. Good evening to both of you. Good evening. And do we have Mr. Bullman on the line? He's here. Um, I'd like to call to order the August 23rd meeting of the Hingham Municipal Light Plant Board. And I will consider the reading of the open meeting language to already have been read. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Good to see you both this evening. All right, um, John, good evening to you. What we're going to do tonight, we're going to uh, interview you the same way we interviewed the last time. So what I'm going to do is we're going to we're going to start off by um, asking you uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, why you're interested in the opening and anything you want us to know. And then uh, each of us uh, are going to ask you one question. And I'd ask the panel to, uh, if you could, to ask the same question we asked the other two candidates to be fair uh, to all those applying. So with that, Mr. Bowman, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the vacancy? Okay. Well, first off, good evening, everybody. Thank you for um, for interviewing me for this position. I've lived in Hingham more or less my whole life. I grew up here. Um, obviously, we moved away for the formidable college years and everything. Uh, moved back about four years ago, uh, raising our my wife and I are raising our two boys here. Um, don't really have any plans on leaving Hingham. You know, I'm living six streets down from where I grew up, so. Um, I just thought it was a good way to give back to community. Um, sure, many of you know, my father sat on the light board for many years and um, you know, know a lot about the history of what the light board was doing back then. Um, I am impressed at some of the directions that the light board has gone since, uh, since then. And you know, I'd like to contribute if, uh, if the committee so feels appropriate. John, thank you very much. All right, let's start with questions from um, the light board. And why don't we start with uh, Laura this evening? Sure, John, thank you so much for volunteering to serve the town. Um, we really appreciate everybody who comes forward and sticks up their hand and is willing to do that. So thanks. Um, I just want to ask, uh, you know, based on your life experience, what do you think is the main skill or um, experience or view the main thing that you would bring to the light board? So um, spent over the last decade uh, serving as a project manager for electrical contractor. Uh, before that did some owner project manager work, uh, including the South Shore Rec project. Um, so, you know, have experience with government agencies um, and have a good understanding of medium voltage distribution um, and what it takes to maintain and upkeep um, such a system. I, you know, my past employer, I ran the maintenance and testing division for about a year and a half, um, you know, where we were testing, you know, medium voltage substations and that sort of thing. I've installed them, you know, medium voltage substations for Verizon and um, worked on them at PNC Gillette World Shape headquarters. So, you know, I have a very good understanding of, of what it takes to distribute power from the medium voltage side all the way down, um, you know, as I kind of mentioned, I do understand some of the history of the light board and things that were done um, in the past. And I've maintained 20 plus megawatts for the solar down the Cape uh, for a client out of California. 
So, you know, understand the removal side of things and, you know, in the direction things are heading. I have some concerns about, you know, the demand that's being placed on the grid and the, you know, move forward is to get off fossil fuels and put everything, you know, more or less into the electric bucket, uh, which presents problems, you know, for ISO New England. And, um, you know, I feel that my past experiences and I've always kind of been a jack of all master none type of deal. So I feel like I can bring, you know, a different perspective to the board. Great. Thanks very much. Michael. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, Dorothy Gallo. Too. It's nice to nice to see you on such a nice location setting. It's very uplifting. Um, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, in order to maintain reasonable rates, reliability, and build resilience, HMLP and the New England Power Grid face a number of challenges as we endeavour to chart a course to our new, our town's 2040 net zero goal. John, what are these challenges and what distinguishes your experience to take the helm as a commissioner in this ever evolving electrification day and age? Well, given my background, I feel that, you know, some of the challenges that we're gonna face are, you know, simple, effects on you know household services you know people go get a ford lightning for instance it's an 80 amp circuit it's going to require 100 amps worth of power it's a continuous load so i mean you're talking 100 amps worth of available power just so they can charge their pickup truck um you know so we're going to get into a situation where you know the normal 200 amp service is now going to be a 320 amp continuous service and and all the ripple effects thereof so i mean you know there's a lot of people that are looking to get away from oil and you know, go to heat pumps now that they work below zero. Um, you know, so now all of a sudden we're going to, it's great that we're getting off of fossil burning fuels, but there's going to be increased demands um, and load on, you know, an already taxed system. Um, you know, Hingham historically does an excellent job at maintaining the, the system, you know, better than the IS, you know, better than the investor owned utilities. Um, you know, but we have our, you know, bumps along the road, you know, especially when we get crazy ice storms and things of that nature. But, you know, it's it's an aging infrastructure and it's it's always out in the elements and it needs to be maintained properly. Um, and, you know, we have these unique situations where, you know, we're getting a ton of power during the day when solar is running, um, you know, yet when solar isn't producing, you know, the gas fired plants and, the, you know, the other fuel plants are now running and, you know, they need to have a certain load to run efficiently. And now we're running into situations where we have an abundance of renewables on the grid during the day, you know, yet the duty cycles on these power plants is getting increased because of the, you know, the, the ramp ups and ramp downs. So, I mean, there's, there's a, you know, kind of a number of areas of concern um, and each one of them kind of, you know, you have to manage with little bites, but I mean, I do feel that, you know, the town of Hingham is going to have some, issues and i know that it, they're already being addressed with possibly getting another circuit out of weymouth um and things of that nature uh which is excellent and you know i know there was concerns that if a tra train ever derailed in the past that you know it could take out you know our existing circuits so so i mean it, it seems like the board's going in a great direction um you know with focused on renewables uh was added to kind of the charter if you may um you know and i just feel that uh you know, that direction needs to continue, uh, but also take into account, you know, that renewables aren't re as reliable as just firing up gas fired and just kind of that sort of thing. Sure. Thank you. All right. Let's start uh, select board questions. Let's go to Joe. Hi. Thank you, Bill. Um, and John, good, good to meet you. Um, so I have a question, but I actually have a preliminary question that is going to be unique to you. Uh, could you currently are at Sullivan and McLaughlin, is that correct? I was up until about a month ago. Okay, because I, I was going to ask whether or not you saw any conflicts with your current employment versus having a position on the board. Um, I don't. I mean, you know, I, I think it, it, 
if the contractor was doing work for the town or it's things of that nature, I think it'd be a problem. But uh, I don't I don't think there's a perceived in, uh, impropriety there. OK, um, so my question, my general question uh, is concerning pricing, uh, whether or not you're familiar with the pricing model used by the light plant and whether you think that model is adequate in terms of serving the needs of the town and making sure that the light plant has sufficient funds to maintain its capital. Well, I mean, given, I mean, the last two years um, have been quite unique uh, when it comes to prices and costs and everything, um, you know, where, where you guys are about to endeavor on, you know, bringing an additional circuit in, I'm sure the cost estimates that were produced at the time are, are significantly different than what it's actually going to cost to produce that work. I mean, copper's gone up significantly. Um, the cost of equipment and lead times has exponentially increased. Um, you know, so on top of fuel costs, which everybody likes to focus on, but I mean, ultimately, you know, there's, there's a number of, you know, cost expenditures that I think are probably going to hit the HMLP in the future. Um, and it's definitely something that's going to have to be closely looked at, uh, cause I mean, there's only so much you can control, but, um, the cost of goods and I mean, just the lead times and everything that's happened over the last 18 months has been, been unreal on, on my side of the equation. And, um, and I feel that it'll impact HMLP, uh, and I'm sure it already has. So, uh, cost right. definitely something that, that, you know, obviously part of the thing that the HMLP board is look is looking out for the ratepayer, um, but it also needs to look out for you know and weigh out the reliability of the system as well. So, thank you, Liz. Great, thanks, Bill, and thank you, John, for applying and being willing to serve the town. Uh, my question is along the lines of Michael's question. Um, how do you see the Municipal Light Board playing a role in meeting Hingham's climate action and carbon neutrality goals? Uh, both directly and indirectly, I see it playing a pivotal role. Um, you know, given, you know, vehicles are, you know, the move of foot is to get off of, you know, gasoline and diesel and onto electric. Um, you know, wh whether or not there's rebates or, or what have you, people are going to be charging their cars. Um, I already touched upon, you know, service sizes and everything else are going to have to be looked at closely. Um, you know, off peak metering was something that was done with hot water heaters and things in the past. It's going to be something that, you know, should be looked at in the future with vehicles in order to kind of, you know, shave the load during the day and be able to help kind of, you know, when power is bought, it's bought in blocks. So as we're buying the power out, you know, we have a consistent load throughout the day and we're pushing the, the EV charging, which doesn't have to happen at six o'clock when people are turning on induction ovens and all those other things, you know, and really ramping up the demand you get in that six to nine hour. That's when all of a sudden people are going to be charging their cars and doing all these, you know, cooking and doing all the activities at home um, and things of that nature. So, you know, I see it being indirect in that respect, you know, and the board needing to make sure that they're working with, you know, Energy New England and their suppliers to to make sure that, you know, there isn't too much exposure and and they're taking all that into account. So, you know, and I kind of touched on the heat pumps. I mean, people are getting away from oil and going to heat pumps. Like there's going to be some direct efforts um, and with the rebates and the various programs that, that are already in place. And I'm sure those programs will expand. But there's also going to be the indirect impact of just things getting off of other sources and on to electric. Sure. Great. Thank you. But John, thanks so much for your, your application and interest in the vacancy. Uh, you mentioned your dad. I did serve with your dad in town government many years ago, and um, he's a great guy and uh, very much appreciate you volunteering to serve the town as well, stepping up tonight. So my, my question for you is uh, over the over the course of the past 10 years ago or so, the um, focus of the light board and HMLP operations have changed quite a bit. Where do you see, or what do you see the needs of the light plant will be in 10 years? Well, like I touched upon, I mean, it's, it's there were kind of three pillars of the board in the past. Um, the fourth pillar was kind of at the evolution of adding, you know, the green portfolio and, and you know, increasing that green portfolio. 
um, you know, given the carbon carbon neutrality goals, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that's going to become a kind of a new cornerstone or pillar of the of the light plant moving forward. Um, I mean, you know how town government works. I mean, it it all depends on the board members and kind of the direction that they see it going. I mean, it, you know, so as new membership evolves, you know, there'll be new direction, but, uh, you know, hopefully there can be a long term strategic path that board members can lay out you know, and help the town meet its goals and, um, you know, get to get to that point. I mean, in the past, it was about cheap power and reliable power and, and all those things. I mean, obviously, that's, you know, that's kind of the older school thinking, uh, you know, as things move forward, it's, it's, you know, obviously, people care about the costs and the reliability of the, the system. But obviously, now that especially the culture of today, um, you know, the, the greenness of it and everything is, is, is ultra important as well, you know, with, with, with the way that global warming's going and everything. John, thanks very much. Uh, before I ask you for a, um, a closing argument, if you will, let me just see if anybody has any other pressing question they'd like to ask you. I'm good, Bill. Liz, good? I'm all set, yes. Thank you, John. Michael and Laura? Yes, thank you. All right. Thanks, John. John, if you'd like to take a minute or so just to um, do a summation, if you'd like, that'd be great. No, I appreciate everybody's time this evening. And uh, I know there was a communication glitch with my email. So I appreciate everybody postponing this decision and um, allowing me the opportunity to, to put my hat in the ring. Excellent. So um, to John and to everybody, I think we're going to take a, a, about 24 hours here to think about. Um, our three applicants, and just wanted to confirm with Laura and Michael, um, are you both good for 2 p.m. tomorrow? Yes, we are. Yes, thank you, Great. Bill. All right, and I know Laura and Laura, Liz and Joe are good as well. Okay, so the the jury will return its verdict tomorrow at 2 p.m. <laughs> so <laughs> stay tuned for the outcome. John, thanks very much for stepping up. You did a great job, and I hope you have a good rest of the night. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah. I will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting of the Hingham Light Board. So moved. Second. All in favor, Mike? Aye. Laura? Aye. Thank you very much, and we will see you tomorrow. Have Thank a great you. evening. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Take Good care. Bye-bye. All right, next item on the agenda is discussion of Warren Article A, uh, which is the Foster Elementary School. And we have uh, the building committee chair, uh, Linda Hill with us this evening and also Ray Estes. And I saw Linda, see, hi Linda, how are you? And is Ray on the call yet? I don't see him yet. I think he's on. Um, oh, I see him in Foster. In team Foster. We're, yeah. we're in the conference room. Excellent, Team Foster gets a great name for your, for your Zoom. Zoom right there. All right, um, Linda Ray, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, great. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, pleased to be here. Uh, we have a number of folks with us. Uh, a couple of our project member uh, manager teams coming in at the moment. Um, we have uh, our superintendent, uh, Murray Adams, Anita Afang from uh, our business uh, director, the school department, Gene Raymond, our art project architect. We have um, um, Chris Carroll and uh, why am I forgetting your name, Sean? Sean, <laughs> Sean Burke from PMA, excuse me. Apologies, um, our project manager. Um, and we also have some other, a uh, couple of other members of the building uh, team um, zooming in. So thanks for having us tonight. We wanted to give you a little bit of an update um, where we were and some specific requests with respect to some financial aspects of the project. Um, and we do have a little presentation. If I could uh, share a screen, um, we will pop that up. Uh, right. Yep. And just before you continue, just do you have a quorum of your committee? Do you need to uh, call a meeting to order? Linda. We don't have a quorum. There's only three of us, Michelle, okay. Ray, and myself. Okay, Sorry. great. Thanks. Thanks for asking though. Yeah. I 
Look at that. Uh, you did it right. It's crazy. Okay. Uh, so you've seen this picture before. This is a rendering of what the school might look like uh, generally um, with representative materials and size and shape and design uh, on the site. Um, that really hasn't changed. Um, what we're going to try to talk about uh, tonight is remind you about the project schedule, which we've um, talked about before, but just wanted to let folks know where we are uh, in the schedule and what's coming up in the immediate future. Um, some programmatic highlights, uh, just to review something that we went through last month with you, uh, just uh, generally how the school is being designed to accommodate the educational program that's been developed for this project and has been approved by the MSBA and the DESE. Um, we're going to talk about uh, very briefly uh, the MSBA grant program our overview and, and essentially remind folks of, of what the total project cost uh, will be. Um, as well as a number of uh, some categories of ineligible items so folks can better understand where the costs are coming from. Um, we'll, uh, we, we did provide a, a significant package of materials for you in advance to review. Uh, we don't expect uh, uh, any answers from that um, 3011 budget form. It's really hard to read. We will pop it up on the screen briefly, but you do have that in detail to examine. We did break that down. Uh, into some, some key eligible and ineligible cost categories just to review generally uh, in terms of overall cost of the project. Um, we can touch on some repair and maintenance cost comparisons. We know that, that um, obviously uh, net zero initiatives are very uh, high um, and important on, on people's minds these days. And we have approached this project from the very beginning um, with that in mind. Um, as we've said before, this is being designed as an all electric building. There will be no fossil fuels used in the building whatsoever at any time other than diesel fuel for a backup generator when and if that's needed. Um, we do have some information on utility cost comparison. If that's of interest, we don't have to get into great detail if it's not, um, but we've provided some materials for you um, and some information with respect to um, current maintenance and utility costs for the existing school, as well as projected costs. Uh, and really the answer to the question that uh, why a building that's going to be 75% larger than the existing building will actually cost less to operate. Um, it's a remarkable question and an even more remarkable answer. Um, we did provide you with a projected cash flow schedule, and we know that folks have been talking about that recently in terms of planning um, or the financing of this project over the next uh, several years. Uh, we can certainly touch on that, but not necessary to get into detail. And to the extent you have any questions, um, we'd be happy to answer whatever we can. Uh, so just a reminder <clears throat> as to where we are on the project. It's near the end of August. Our next key date, um, building committee is meeting uh, on the 31st. Uh, that's the same day as the MSBA um, is expected to approve this project. They will approve the project formally and set the total project cost of the budget. That number has not changed. Um, it's in your materials and we'll talk about it in just a minute. Um, we are currently uh, through schematic design and in deep into design development. Um, we are proceeding with design and about to um, prepare uh, an initial phase uh, site work bid package that will be bid in, I think, the second week of October um, with the anticipation of a special town meeting approval on November 1st, a uh, successful ballot vote on November 8th, and then an award of that first site work bid package uh, 10 days thereafter. Um, that site work is expected to begin in early December uh, and will begin the preparation of the site um, for the construction of the building. The, uh, the, the documents for the construction of the building will uh, continue to be developed through the fall and winter. There will be additional cost estimates that are um, required by the MSBA at the 60% threshold and the 90% threshold. Um, those will be uh, incorporated into um, refining uh, the construction documents for bid for the vertical construction of the building, which we anticipate uh, sometime around April. Um, and then we will uh, break ground 
uh, late spring, early summer, um, probably around June, I would expect um, for uh, construction of the building in 2023 with opening anticipated in September of 24. Uh, there will be some additional site work that will follow um, after the existing building is demolished in late summer uh, of 24. Um, it'll take through the fall and into the spring to finish the site work, the drainage infrastructure onto the parking lot, the parking, the softball field, the tennis courts, things of that nature um, that are, can't be built until the old school is, is removed. Um, so that's where we are on schedule. We anticipate the full project to be completed in the spring of 25. And um, that's really where we are on that. Did I miss anything, Gene? No, I think you got it. Any questions on the schedule at all? Okay. Um, just a reminder about um, you know, how this school is being designed and why it's being designed um, the way it is. Um, there was an educational plan developed that's geez, 60 pages, 70 pages, something of that nature um, that was developed specifically for this school. Um, it actually contains a number of um, uh, approaches to learning that are new uh, and are going to be um, incorporated into the entire district. Uh, and we're really excited to hear about that. And certainly to the extent there are questions, we have our superintendent, Margaret Adams, here to speak to those. Um, this is a three-story building um, designed with uh, a lot of community space on the first floor with gymnasium and cafeteria access. Um, music spaces, multi-purpose space for field science, as well as um, community use um, and other purposes that uh, that the school operations may may determine. Um, the uh, first floor will also house uh, an expansion of the district's pre-kindergarten program, um, which is very exciting. Uh, it's something that um, we've wanted to do uh, in this town for a number of years. There's certainly lots of folks who are eager to participate in the program. And actually, in order to um, get into compliance with respect to our requirements, um, we need to expand the program. So we're excited to be able to do that. Um, there will be um, uh, many spaces for special education programs, uh, both therapeutic learning and language-based spaces. Um, as I said, on the outside, we'll have tennis courts, softball fields, playgrounds that are accessible to all. Uh, and ample parking, where of course today there is not ample parking. Um, we're, we're constructing a gymnasium that um, complies with MSBA guidelines, but exceeds it just a little bit because we learned from the construction of East School that the gym is just a little bit too small with sidelines just a little bit too tight and for safety reasons and for uh, really the convenience of the community who use, uh, use uh, community members who use these gyms uh, very frequently, um, it's important to have um, bleachers available for folks to sit and come watch the games. These gyms are not just used by the schools, they're used by uh, youth sports programs um, and, and really constantly throughout the year. Um, the, uh, the floors uh, above the, the first floor will, will house the, um, well, the first, right, the first floor, the, the first, Grade and kindergarten is on the on the uh, second floor. On the yeah. second floor, yeah. and, three and then three yeah. through five on the um, on the third floor. Um, so classroom spaces, um, uh, special education spaces, um, you know everything to accommodate the educational plan that that is going to be uh, executed uh, in this new building. So here's a slide that we've showed before and we've talked about. So just a reminder on the, the, the total project cost that has been developed through schematic design, and that's the threshold that the MSBA looks for in terms of approval. Um, 113 million, 335, 749, that's a big number. It includes four and a half million or so in project contingency. Uh, so it's really 108 and change um, with project contingency available, which is necessary. Um, the reimbursement rate um, based on our, our, our base rate of 36.89 plus some maintenance credit, as well as sustainability green schools credits that will get through the LEED certification program will total 40.54% in reimbursement. 
Um, that's the good news. As we've talked about before, there are a number of costs that are deemed ineligible, and that's because of um, in your packet that we sent to you, um, there's an explanation of kind of what the MSBA considers general categorical ineligible costs. And then there is a list of specific ineligible items, particular to this project. Um, just in general, um, there's a cap of construction costs of 360 per square foot. Um, just a reminder, uh, when we built the middle school, uh, broke ground 10 years ago, uh, that was bid, came in under budget, and was 285 a square foot. The MSBA's cap has gone up, obviously, since then with, with rising construction costs, but we're seeing construction costs in the five and $600 per square foot levels these days, um, and there's no indication that they're going to going to come down anytime soon. So we're up against that 360 per square foot construction cap. So anything above 360 per square foot will not be reimbursed by the MSBA. Um, there's also a, a site construction cap. That's 8% of the building cost. With this site, we have significant site costs um, because of the constraints. It's a 39 acre site, but only seven acres is developable. Um, we have wetlands, we have riverfront, we have an upland. Um, there are a number of constraints. And as a result of not only limited areas to site a building, but really the um, optimal uh, place to site a building um, for both physical and educational um, reasons. We're cutting into Otis Hill somewhat, um, and we're going to use the fill uh, in that portion of the hill that we cut into in order to raise up the site. And that will help us to address some of the uh, concerns with respect to future floodplain um, and other constraints. Um, as a result, there are site costs that um, that exceed that 8% cap. Um, so when I get to a, a slide that's coming up next, we'll be able to break that down a little bit so we can show you how much of the site costs are going to be reimbursable and how much are not to get a better sense overall of the project from different categories in terms of, of cost uh, eligibility. Um, FF&E, what we call furniture fit, pictures and equipment, um, is capped at $1,200 per student. Same thing with technology. Um, we're going to exceed those cost caps in both categories, and that's based on our educational program. Um, and as my architect explains, um, that's pretty common and typical um, for you know, similar uh, educational uh, situations. Um, soft costs. That's everything that's not actual you know, building construction that's... Uh, design, project management, legal fees, permitting fees, things of that nature, those are capped at 20% of the building costs. So anything exceeding that is not reimbursable. And then anything with respect to solar installations, uh, we are talking about installing solar panels on the roof. We haven't made that decision uh, entirely yet and we have time to do it. Um, it wouldn't be reimbursable anyway by the MSBA. So it's not something that has to be um, approved by them or not. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to determine the best way to pay for it. We think the cost is going to be in the neighborhood of $670,000. Um, we think we can cover that with project contingency, but that also depends on what the bid comes in at uh, and how much contingency is available. So that's a decision our, our committee is going to make a little bit down the road. Um, we did look at the possibility of solar canopies in the parking lot. Those are millions of dollars and prohibitively uh, expensive and challenging um, to approach uh, um, even from a kind of PR standpoint. So we've kind of put that aside uh, as something that we're not interested in pursuing at the moment. Um, there is going to be um, utility conduit installed in the parking lot. So at some point in the future, someone wanted to pursue that if there were funding available for solar canopies, and that was something that someone wanted to pursue, um, then that, that certainly is an option that could be pursued. Um, this, and I, I won't spend any time on this because you really can't see it. So these two pages are what the MSBA calls the 3011. This is the official budget document that they approve, which breaks down really every line item category uh, in the project 
and uh, indicates how much of that is eligible, how much of it is ineligible, and comes down to essentially what the total project grant will be. Now, even though on August 31st, the MSBA will approve this project, they'll approve the total project budget, the cap will not uh, be, I'm sure, the, the final grant will not be set really until uh, we do project closeout, maybe six months or so after the project is completed in 2025, because we have to, everything gets audited by the MSBA and they have to you know, go through everything that's been done with a fine tooth comb to determine whether it was supposed to be eligible, not eligible. And at that point, the, the total uh, facilities grant will be set. We expect the facilities grant to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 uh, million, dollars, um, but that's a really a round number um, that will be confirmed later on. That budget is in your packages um, that we deliver to you. Um, certainly we can answer questions about it. It's hard to read on the screen, but we do have hard copies here. We know that you do. Uh, and we can certainly make them available to the public to the extent that they want to see them. Um, this slide, um, as I said, breaks down some of the key categories uh, in the total project budget. And I think this is an important slide um, to really get a good understanding of the costs for certain key categories. Um, you know, whether it's you know design and project management, which is part of soft costs, right? Um, um, but some of that is eligible for reimbursement, some of it is not. Um, and you see there that Gene has put together a, a chart that lists the uh, percentage of eligible and non-eligible um, items in each category. You'll see things like demolition going to be covered 100% by the MSBA, which is great news. By the way, some of his, some have suggested, you know, trying to explore another site, as you know, we did look at other options for other available sites, and there were no other available sites for redevelopment for an elementary school in North Hingham. Um, so we are doing the best we can and working with the site, and we think it's going to be a terrific um, result in the end. But if we had explored a different site, the demolition of Foster, if we had built a school or going to build a school someplace else, would not be reimbursable at all. So here, it's 100% reimbursable, which is, which is terrific. Site work, as I mentioned, um, is one of those items that has a cap. And in this um, project, we have significant site costs because of the constraints um, and what we need to do um, to prepare the site for a new school. Uh, and as a result, only 41% of that site work will be eligible for reimbursement. Um, some of the other categories a little bit higher. Um, but then, you know, in terms of building, you're running up against that per square foot cost cap. And based on the cost estimates that we've received that have informed uh, what we expect the, the total project budget to be approved at uh, next week, that, um, that reimbursement number is just a little bit over half, uh, unfortunately, um, due to the cost cap. Um, then you have other things like utilities, testing, moving, um, you know, some of the some of the work that we've done on site, um, furnishings and equipment and technology, as I mentioned, there is a cap uh, associated with each of those per student allocation, the MSBA allows, and all of those total 108 and change um, in, in total project budget, and then the construction contingency, that's the percentage um, that's added on to that, giving a total project cost of the 113, 335, 7. 49. <clears throat> um, carrying those eligible percentages forward, you can see where the maximum potential grant is listed at 25,118,559. Again, that's an estimate based on currently known eligible costs. Um, and again, this is based on the total project budget the MSBA will approve. Hopefully, when the bids come in, the bids are consistent with those numbers. Um, and uh, if not, below. So that's kind of a summary of, of those numbers. I didn't know if anyone wanted to ask questions or we could just get through this presentation and then come back to things um, as you like. Great, why don't you just go through the presentation and then we can open it up for questions. That might be better. Very good. Thank you though. Um, repair and routine maintenance cost comparison. So, uh, this 
this actually shows, and maybe I'm going to let Aisha speak to this because she could speak to this maybe better than I can. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. Yeah. So basically, what we what we have done here is that we've um, looked at ex expenses over the last um, few years that have been unplanned expenses, and most of those unplanned expenses have come about with with an age back and other other areas where we've had boiler issues and other issues come up within the foster build the current foster building. And looking at that over time, you can see that we expect actually that if it is that we don't get the building um, approved this year, that these costs will just continue to skyrocket in order to keep the kids in there and in, in the building as well. But, um, but these are basically an idea of some of the expenses that we've had over time. The, also to remember that um, during the COVID, during COVID, what we had to do was to move a lot of kids out of foster for the K to second grade, um, take them to foster north um, because the building was too small. And in terms of um, air, air ventilation within the building, we didn't have any ventilation. So that's an additional cost that we had to improve um, because of the size of foster and because of the ventilation issues that we have. So that's just basically um, the expenses that we have here. Also, there's also another, another side that we'll, we'll discuss where we talk about the actual utilities. I think that's on the next, the yep. next one as well. And just looking at the utilities over, over time here, you will see that um, for the new foster building, even, even with, the, with the, new, um, the new system that we will have in place here, our costs now will actually be a lot lower compared to the, the past costs. Um, our costs, our, our costs in terms of um, the new foster building will be lower than the past costs that we've had, uh, particularly if oil using oil and um, and 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 others that we have. Other, using the oil, we our oil costs will be higher than even using electricity and um, and gas within the building because we'll be all electric. Yeah, one of the interesting things about what we're doing in terms of heating and cooling. So we've, we've chosen um, you know, a very net zero friendly option of ground source heat pumps, uh, where we'll have geo, uh, geothermal wells installed um, under the playground um, uh, to the south of the school. And uh, even though that's the upfront cost for that is more than it would be for a gas-fired um, you know, furnace or boiler or even air source heat pumps, which I think the uh, public safety uh, project uh, is, is going with. Um, uh, the, the cost savings and energy efficiency over time is greater. And I think we found in Hingham that um, when you spend a little bit more upfront, and you have return on investment over time, um, that's really valued by folks in town. Um, and I think um, that the cost savings on an annual basis in terms of budgeting uh, with respect to utility costs and repair and maintenance um, of the facilities is gonna really be appreciated um, in terms of keeping those numbers down. And Aisha said it's actually gonna be less in annual maintenance and utility costs than the current building. Um, and that's a building that's, that's 126,000 square feet versus 71,000 square feet. So 75% larger um, and more efficient and less costly to maintain and uh, operate. Okay. Um, this next slide, we don't have to go into detail at all. This is just the cash flow projection for the full project that we provided to you. It's very difficult to read on this screen, we realize, but you do have hard copies, I think. Um, we can talk more about that if you like, but I know that there are other discussions going on in town about how to uh, approach um, the financing for this project over time. And this is just uh, kind of a uh, what I call a little bit of a cartoon, but a picture of what the uh, facade and outdoor the front of the school might look like when it's uh, completed based on the choice of materials um, and how it's been designed. Um, and there you have it. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Ray, uh, Linda, and team, thank you very much for the presentation. That was that was excellent. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Liz to ask questions first tonight. But before I do, I, I have one preliminary question. 
Uh, am I correct that the MSBA is voting on voting on this on the 31st? Yes. Yeah, I believe it's in the morning, 10 o'clock. I think it's 10 a.m. Yes. 10 a.m., yeah. Thank you. So my my question, my follow-up question is right. Once the MSBA votes, are we able to continue to uh, tweak the design or try to reduce costs at all, or are we locked into that number um, on the on the vote on the 31st? Yes. So we have another round of uh, value engineering coming up, I think, in the next couple of weeks. Um, th those are actually not only encouraged by the MSBA, but required by the MSBA. Um, and there are certainly things that we've been talking about. We've already, um, in the initial schematic design, value engineered uh, about a million dollars down. Um, and we're going to continue to look at things you know, very closely uh, to see what we can do to cut costs. Um, so yes, absolutely. The, there will be opportunities to tweak the design uh, as well as, you know, there, there certainly might be changes that come through permitting, right? Um, through the CONCOM or through planning board, uh, as well as value engineering exercises that we that we go through over the next couple of months. Great. Thank you, Ray. Let me turn it to Liz. Great. Thanks, Bill. And thank you, Ray um, and Foster team for the presentation. Um, I know a tremendous amount of work has gone into this. Um, and I appreciate you presenting to us again and, and answering our questions. Um, I think we all want the questions and answers out there for the public to feel well informed um, and ready to, to make a decision in November. Um, so just, Ray, if you could just talk a little bit about the size of the building. I know you said it's 75% larger than the current building. Um, so I just I just want to understand kind of how we got to that square footage. Um, obviously, we want it to be large enough to plan for future needs, um, but you know, want it to be a reasonable size based on enrollment, et cetera. Right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, let me just say you know one thing briefly, and then I'll turn it over to Gene, our architect, who can speak to some specifics on that. Um, this this project, as I said, began with an education plan. Um, but it also began with a design enrollment that was set by the MSBA. So the school department and the school building committee worked on its own enrollment study about four years ago. I think Dr. Gallo, who's on the call tonight, um, was superintendent then, and we worked together on that. Um, and that concluded that over the ensuing 10 years, there was going to be an increase of about 100 students um, in in. Um, in town, and most of those would likely be in the Foster district. Um, the MSBA then did its own uh, enrollment study um, mm -hmm. and came up with a design enrollment based on you know, current uh, enrollment and projections um, of 605. So, you know, one of the questions that people have asked is, why are you building a building for 600 students when you only have 400 now? Well, before COVID, I think we had 489. We did have a reduction in students as a result of COVID. Um, a number of uh, families have taken their kids out of public school. Um, but we expect, and I think the numbers for this coming year are 410 or 420, something like that. I'm not sure exactly what they are. But we expect and anticipate that those numbers will come back. Um, we also have no reason to believe that the projections that the MSBA did uh, and that we did when we did our enrollment study won't be true in the next 10 years. COVID doesn't impact that necessarily. Um, so while, you know, as a snapshot in time today, the number isn't what it was two years ago, there's a reason for that, but there's there's no reason to, to think that the projections won't still um, be true. So the size of the building is really dictated by the enrollment. Um, and the MSBA has, um, categories of spaces. Uh, one of the first things that we work on during schematic design is called a space summary. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a list of spaces that you're supposed to have in a building, the number of classrooms, how big they're supposed to be. The MSBA requires the classrooms be 900 square feet each, right? Um, how many classrooms, um, how many special ed spaces, how much administrative space, gym, cafeteria, all of these spaces are enumerated and they're, they're um, indicated with specific square footage um, requirements. So not only do we have to meet those requirements, um, in some instances in our space summary, we do exceed those requirements and there are reasons for those and we can certainly speak to those 
um, to the extent that, that folks are interested. Um, but that, that is significantly driving the size of the building is the, the enrollment, the number of classrooms that we have to have um, to suit that enrollment, uh, whether it's that enrollment on day one, or it's gonna be there five years from now or 10 years from now, we don't know. Just a reminder on the middle school, the design enrollment for that was 1020, I think, if I recall. We exceeded that design enrollment on day one when we opened the school. In fact, while we were designing it, we had to add more lockers because we were going to have more kids. But the MSBA sets an enrollment that is an average, not a peak. Mm -hmm. And it looks at data over a period of time and comes up with a number. And while there may be ebbs and flows for enrollment, um, there's really no way at this point to go back to the MSBA and say, you know what, we're not going to have 605. What you said was wrong. We're only going to have whatever. Let's redesign the building. Really can't do that at this point. That would derail the project for years, maybe kick us out of the pipeline. Um, we might have to reapply. We lose our, our spot. Um, and again, as I said, there's no indication that we won't have um, the design the design enrollment met in you know the number of years that they indicate. So mm -hmm. Jean, did you want to I, I'll yeah, just say uh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Few other things. Um the, the existing foster has a cafeteria and gymnasium that are teeny tiny. Uh part of uh the MSBA program is this prescriptive size that's what I think Ray's touched on. So this building has a larger gym, larger cafeteria. It has a, uh, a stage that serves both, which is required by MSBA, uh, but not in the existing building. Um, the pre-K program is taking up six large classrooms plus a number of administrative spaces. And that program does not exist at the existing foster. Um, for the increased enrollment, there's uh, pretty much, it translates to about one extra classroom per grade. So there's six more um, K through five classrooms in the school. And um, there's also to support the Kids in Action program, Ray had shown that um, that blue multi-purpose room, which is a pretty sizable room down on the first floor, um, it is going to serve the educational program because it will be used by the field science, also for large group activities and professional development. But after school, they're going to be uh, there's a big cohort of kids that are going to be using that. And it, as I understand it from the school department, it's actually a money maker. So um, there are a number of spaces. Oh, there's a couple of um, um, dedicated um, special ed classrooms for programs that don't exist in the school also. So it sounds like a big expansion and it is in fact, but it's all within the um, confines of the MSBA grant program and some spaces that the school building committee feels that the, this town and this district wants to have in the school. Great, that's helpful. And I know the MSBA um, had set the enrollment number at 605 um which makes sense I, I think it is worth trying to understand for ourselves how many families are coming back um in the short term so we know if the number is closer you know closer to 400 or 500 when the school opens um I'd love to see just some outreach there to understand you know how, how many families are returning how many students will have aged out by the time the schools open um just just kind of for our own our own knowledge um, in terms of, so I understand there are spaces that are required, uh, which makes sense. Can you just help us understand some of the additional spaces that are not eligible for reimbursement? Uh, right. It's 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 not it's not really that they're not eligible, but they are um, they're well. Some of them aren't eligible. Some of them are capped um, in terms of, of, of amount of space. Like some of the um, administration and guidance space, I think that we have um, is limited uh, by reimbursement because we exceed the amount of square footage um, that they have in the space summary. Um, but there are other spaces, uh, the multi-purpose room, um, because it's going to be um, used for the field science program um, and also KIA. That's not reimbursable 
um, the pre-kindergarten classrooms are fully reimbursable, are, are fully reimbursable um, because early on we said that we wanted it, it was part of our educational program that um, the approach to, to um, you know, finding a solution for the current foster school was um, to expand our pre-K program. And this was an opportunity to do that. And the MSBA said, okay, we agree. Um, so that's a good thing. That's um, great. And is we, that tuition-based, Ray? It is um, for, for typical students. Yes. For special ed students, um, it's, it's fully covered in cost, but for typical students, right. um, there is tuition. Um, okay. There are spaces for a METCO director um, because there is no space in the district for the new METCO director who was just recently hired. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we felt, and the school administration felt that it was important that we designate space. And I think it's something like 150 square feet. So it's not a lot of space, uh, if I remember, um, but that's not reimbursable. Um, Jean, remind me, there's- uh, I think, I think you know, 95 plus percent of the building is reimbursable. The entire special education program, all the classroom space, there's three music rooms. Um, those are all fully reimbursable. It really came down to the multi-purpose room uh, and then some of these administrative offices being the biggest chunk. Um, and then of course, you know, you run up against that $360 a square foot cap. Yeah, so that was, that was kind of my next question. Is anyone building a school at that price per square foot? No. No. No one in the state? No. no. It's, it's really an accounting uh, formula on the yeah. behalf of MSBA because there's so much need across the state. It does not represent, nor does the $1,200 per, per student for computers or for furnishings. Those do not represent the real costs um, anywhere. Okay. Okay, I had one, one question about um, the special education services that you mentioned. Um, do we feel like that will meet the needs to keep more students in district? I know obviously it's not just the classroom, it's also the educational professionals, but um, do we feel like we're gonna move the needle there in terms of keeping kids in district? Um, so I don't think that that's the primary um, goal of it. Okay. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that there are kids that would be served in those programs who necessarily go out of district now. Um, it's possible, um, but I think the, the development of those programs is part of an approach to learning that we haven't been able to uh, deliver in district before because we haven't had the space. And I think this is an opportunity for us to be able to deliver appropriate services for our students who need them because we're going to have the space to do it. It's not necessarily people... And I don't mean you, Liz, but people immediately say, well, can you bring kids back in the district and save money on tuitions? Our approach, and I speak this not as an educator, but as someone who's familiar with it, um, our approach is to make sure that we can educate the whole child, right? And that includes the kid that excels in math and reading and the kid who needs, um, you know, special services to do everything. Um, and we haven't been able to, um, to give programmatic attention to the kids who need certain services because we just don't have the space. So this is an opportunity. And as, as um, our educators and administrators develop this educational plan, that was top of mind um, with an opportunity to, to be able to do that. Um, so therapeutic learning, language-based classrooms, um, the, those are, we, we see this as an opportunity. Um, if the byproduct is that there are some kids who are out of district who might come back, then that's a bonus, I think, right? Sure. So is there space to serve kids at other elementary schools or just the foster population? Uh, I, I don't, I think the goal is that this would just be the foster population. Okay. Um, there, there could be occasions, I suppose, that, um, you know, certain programs given there could, could bring kids from some of the other elementary schools in town, but I don't think that that's the intention. Um, 
And that's something that would be, you know, an operational decision by the educators. Okay. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned the, the formula, kind of the per pupil um, allotment for the FFE and the and the technology. So, how can you just give us an idea how 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 much higher are we than kind of that allotment? Do we have that number, Chris? Yeah, we do. It's all on your side. So it's not just on the breakdown. It's it's on the breakdown because it would be the ineligible portion. Is right, 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 right. Yeah. So the, the FF and here we go. You got it there. Yep. Okay. Right. So our costs are a million six for uh, right. for furnishings and equipment. And only 44% of those ineligibles because we're exceeding that cap um, by 56%. Okay. And is, is that pretty system. standard, what, what you're seeing? It is. You, you just did an analysis of this. Uh, it is. It is. And um, I will say during the um, planning for the project that we met with the district's technology director. And Joe Andrews. We went through a, um, a complete line by line of what how many monitors, how many computers, how many servers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, would be in each space within the building. Um, kind of in keeping with the value engineering that we talked about, um, we are going to touch base again on both furnishings and technology and make sure that, you know, there's, there are no uh, areas where we might be able to um, trim, some, trim some costs. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things we're going to look at is to the extent there's any furniture that can be salvaged and reused in the new building, we will try to do that. We're not quite sure how much of that will be possible. There was quite a bit of that in the middle school that we were able to re, um, reuse, um, and that did cut down on the furnishings number uh, in that instance. I'm not so sure that that will be the case uh, here. Okay. And for technology, are we talking about outfitting the classrooms with computers? Um, or are we are you are we talking about like one to one device for students? Yeah, my understanding is this is just for the classrooms. This is not a one to one or okay. or but I don't know. The, hold on. Yeah, I can't. Um, I I would have to get back to you with the precise answer. I I believe it is. Um, but let me reserve the right to go back into the budget. We've okay. been focused so much on the building. I apologize. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, and then just just one other question about the timeline. Um, I know the MSBA is making a decision on August 31st. Um, and, and Bill kind of touched on this, but if you can just explain kind of what what flexibility do we have between August 31st and when the construction documents are you know completely done, we have the bids, the awards. Um, I mean, what if the numbers change significantly? What what happens then? Right. So the, the number that the MSBA approves, the 113 number, that's the number that's going to town meeting. And the, the total that total appropriation needs to be approved in order to move forward. Yes. Now, the hope is that not only can we value engineer, but maybe tweak the design. I'm sure there'll be some you know, changes here and there with respect to planning and CONCOM, um, as well as the bids. The bids are going to be a huge um a huge facet in this. Um, we hope that they come in. We got very lucky with the middle school. Um, we talked to some cost estimators just two days ago, uh, and they gave us some kind of not great news that they're not seeing any low bids um, right now, which is a little bit um, frustrating. Um, but we have our fingers crossed, and we're hoping for you know low bids. But we certainly have the ability to tweak the design. Um, to value engineer as much as we can um, without, you know, the, the one thing we have to take into account with value engineering is, yeah, can you can you cut certain costs and maybe reduce certain finishes and things of that nature, equipment, what have you, but you need to be careful not to do it to the detriment of the education plan, right? Because that's the most important aspect of this whole project. It's all about building a building to deliver curriculum. Um, so, you know, that's an exercise that we're going to be involved in for the next several months. Um, and we have our fingers crossed and hope that we can, you know, reduce costs as much as possible. Great, great. 
Um, and I know you've worked very hard to have it be a green building and energy efficient, so thank you. Um, and I did see that the estimated utility costs are expected to be less, so that's that's good news. Um, does that also include, I'm assuming air conditioning is a, a new cost that Foster doesn't currently have air conditioning. So is that also included if there's air conditioning over the summer months or early fall? Yeah, that's one of the amazing things, even though it's a larger building, it's gonna be fully air conditioned. It's gonna have a lot more fresh air uh, and the utility costs are projected to be lower than what you're spending on a smaller school right now. That, that existing foster school is an energy nightmare. <laughs> Yes, to um, say it, the it, least. Yeah, it just, the building envelope is, has almost no <laughs> insulation. Yeah. Understood. Okay. I, I think that's it for me for now. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Liz, thank you. I'll turn to Joe. Yes. Um, so thanks to the foster team. This is really tremendous. Um, and I think you've heard from the select board before that, um, we all agree that something's gotta be done about Foster. We've done the tour and we know that uh, it's important that we move forward. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions just to make sure that we get the information out. Um, I just wanna make sure I understand it. We're talking about a cost estimate of approximately 113 million and a maximum MSBA grant of about 25 million. Are those two numbers right? Yes, that's right. So that's, uh, a return, that's a grant coverage of about 22%. Um, is that common among MSBA projects for that percentage? Because yeah, I think it is, I think we've, we've done some research to that effect. Um, the, 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 the driving factor is um, the in, ineligible costs. And really the huge driving factor is the construction cap and the site work cap in this instance, because we're, we're, we're capped at 360 per square foot, and construction costs are coming in five, six hundred a square foot these days. Um, you know, obviously anything above three hundred and sixty is not going to be reimbursable at all. So that reduces your overall uh, effective reimbursement rate. So right. forty point five four drops down because of the ineligible uh, percentage uh, in each of those categories. The site costs the same thing. Sure. I mean, what what I had seen and it may be outdated is more coverage of, on the order of 39 or 40 percent. Um, and I'm seeing us at 22 percent and it just seemed really low. Yeah, um, well, as I said, you know, 10 years ago, the middle school uh, was 285 a square foot. That's what the bids came in at. Um, the appropriation was 60 million, 910, 920, if I remember correctly. And the project budget was 56, four. So it was four and a half million under. Um, two and a half, uh, two, two million of that was because we got, we got low bids um, and we were really lucky. This climate is not like that, unfortunately. Yep. So, you know, we're, we're, we're really up against uh, kind of a conflagration of events, not just COVID related, um, but all of the things that are happening in the global economy now that kind of have erupted out of COVID and now kind of expanded and are continuing in terms of global supply chain, work for, workforce uh, issues, um, costs of materials. Um, you know, we, we had some discussion with our cost estimators recently and they've never seen anything like it. And the unfortunate thing is, you know, you could ask, and maybe you're going to ask this, then why are we doing this now? Well, we, we've we already waited too long and the costs are not going to go down. So if we don't do this now, when are we going to do it? And if we do ever get to it, it's going to be exponentially more expensive. So you're right. I am going to ask it. And my my view is um, we've, wait, we've waited too long. Um, absolutely. Uh, but we're going to get questions about, well, given the environment we're in, does it make sense to work to wait any longer? Uh, and I think you've answered it. It, it simply doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, our, we, we had discussion with our cost estimators about it just this week. And they said there's no indication that the, the construction costs are going to come down anytime soon, that the cost of materials are going to come down anytime soon. There's no reason to believe and waiting right. is there's, there's always an escalation factor built in. So the cost estimate that we got 
that is informing the total project cost for this includes, I think, a 5% cost escalation. Um, and that's, you know, generally um, something that will carry throughout the life of the project. Our cost estimators feel that that's yeah. uh, confident that that's, that's um, you know, conservative enough um, uh, to carry us through. Um, but there's there's really no way to protect against increased costs. So yep. if, we, if we wait we any longer- We would also lose our place with the MSBA and have to start over at, at, from ground zero with them and be ba invited back into the program. It's no guarantee that that would happen. So you potentially lose the 25 million um, from them and delays the project by how many more years? Absolutely, yes. Sure. Um, let me turn to the um, student population. I know Liz covered that. What is the enrollment currently at uh, at Foster? Four ten. I believe it's four ten for the school year starting in a couple okay. weeks. So, um, so we're looking. You know, I'm just using round numbers. We're looking. We're, we're building a school with a for a population currently about four hundred, but we're building it for about six hundred, which is assumes a growth rate of fifty percent, um, and. Hingham is not seeing that growth in its population. And the projections that the town has been looking at is seeing that the largest growth is really gonna be in the senior population. So are you comfortable that this is the right number to be using as you roll out on the school? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take issue with the premise of your question for just a second. I think that when you talk about the largest uh, group uh, in terms of population, that's existing people, right? Who are just aging, okay? It's me becoming older, it's you becoming older, right? When we I talk, I, mean, I, I think that's that's not right because we're seeing an influx of new residents who are seniors. So it's but not just when we existing. did our when we do enrollment studies, they look and they go back at records and they look at um, new buildings, they look at deaths, they look at births. So yep. they base it all on statistical information that they're taking just from the town of Hingham. Um, yep. And that's where they arrive at that figure. Okay. Yeah, I, do, I, I do think that there, you know, we've, we've seen, and I've been talking to realtors recently, um, we've seen a huge influx of new young families in town who have school-aged children, um, some of whom are coming into town and haven't had kids yet, but are planning to. Um, you know, certainly all those things were taken into account in the projections that were done for the enrollment study that the MSBA used to fix its design enrollment. And, you know, they went through an arduous process, came up with a number, and that's what they set for the design of this project. And that's what we need to design to. We have no reason to believe, you know, even, even if the, the percentage that we're seeing in growth in enrollment in town does not necessarily uh, jive up with, um, you know, what what we're what we're looking at in terms of you know the actual numbers at Foster. We have no reason to believe that the projections over the next decade aren't going to come true. Right. And and I'm, I, I'm correct that we're building based on the MSBA projection. We are okay. And so I mean that's important because they reimburse based on their own projection. That's right. Uh, so I think it's a reasonable approach to, to go forward in that, on that basis. Um, so uh, you know, if, if we diminished it, we'd be taking away money that the MSBA would otherwise be reimbursing this way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an important factor to consider. Um, let me move from population to um, permitting. Can you just review where the project stands with the various town boards, like the Planning, Zoning, Conservation Commission? Sure, we, we, uh, we submitted our application for a site plan review and we actually had our first hearing before the planning board last evening. Um, we uh, submitted an application, the notice of intent to the Conservation Commission, and we have now had two hearings um, with conservation, most recently this last Monday night, last Monday night, the 15th, I think it was, um, and we're meeting with them, uh, cons conservation again on the 29th, and we'll be back before the planning board, I think on September 12th. Um, we do hope to get through both, uh, boards by the end of September. Um, but that's, that's where we stand. We, we think, uh, everything's been going well. 
we've been answering questions, we've been pro providing additional materials, um, working with the peer review engineers, which we uh, did um, at the outset and actually even before we submitted our application, uh, we started talking with um, the administrators for both conservation and planning, uh, sat down so we made sure we were all on the same page with how we were going to approach certain things uh, and what their boards might be looking for uh, in terms of specifics. Uh, and then since then, we've made efforts to, to make sure we got materials uh, and reports to the peer review engineers um, you know, in advance of meetings so that they can prepare. We can then respond timely um, and we feel good about uh, you know, how things have been going so far. Would it be your um, assumption that permits, that that permitting process will be concluded prior to the town meeting when we have a discussion about this? Yes, the, the permitting actually has to be completed before we bid the site work package in October. So the answer is yes. Great. Um, I just would not want to go to town meeting and say, well, we're still looking at certain things. So I'm glad to hear that that, that will be concluded prior to, to the town meeting. Um, let me ask about alternatives. Uh, you spoke about you've looked at other sites and there was really nothing available. Um, was there consideration of combining the foster school operations with East, South, and Plymouth River so we'd have three schools rather than four no. uh, and there would be no need to build at a foster school but instead enhance the other school locations? Yeah, the, the MSBA wouldn't allow us to do that. That wasn't an option that was available to us through the program. Um, what, what they provided to us were options that included uh, a renovation of the existing school, a renovation addition, or a new construction uh, option. Um, the, if, you, if you remember before 2009, when East School opened, we had three elementary schools after the old East School was demolished yeah. in, I think, 2002, it became the library, it was used for different things, but it hadn't been used for an as an elementary school for many years before that. Um, and we had severe overcrowding in the three elementary schools. Um, and we can't go back to that, um, but it's not an option for the MSBA. We explored the options um, that they asked us to. Um, you know, I think we looked at 11 different options um, for the foster site, which include an addition um, renovation option. Um, and that was determined to be uh, infeasible, unfeasible, um, cost prohibitive, uh, and likely to be <clears throat> um, inundated in a 500 year flood event in 50 years. Um, so really what we're pursuing is the most out of those 11 options, the option that we chose uh, is actually the most, uh, the least expensive, most cost effective, the best for the educational program, and the best use of the site in terms of its natural resources. Um, so we, we felt, uh, and by the way, our committee came to consensus on that choice pretty quickly. Uh, and we feel really confident about it, um, and we do believe it's the right, the right option. Great. Um, could you talk a little bit about your plans for operating foster during construction and then in the immediate year following construction when the old school would then presumably be um, destroyed? So first, in terms of while well, construction's happening. Sure. Um, well, obviously, with an active construction site um, with young children, safety is always the primary concern. We went through this process with the middle school where we built on an occupied school site previously. So um, I think our school administration uh, is familiar with the process, even though there's been some turnover. There's definitely some institutional memory there um, as well. Our project team, um, the contractor that we hire, the project manager that's going to be involved on a day-to-day -day basis, our architect um, and others are well versed in this type of, um, you know, occupied site construction. Um, so there will be a specific construction plan put in place that's going to be part of um, the permitting process. We actually got some questions from the planning board last night uh, to that effect, and um, our engineers are working on. Um, you know, those plans right now. 
Um, there will be a well, kind of a well designed plan that um, you know will be set up to ensure the safety of the students, both coming and going, transport, um, on site. We've um, made arrangements for relocation of play space uh, and playground equipment um, while the construction is going on. Um, certain areas designated for for various things, um, and it's all part of a of a grand scheme. The, the uh, folks at this table have been doing this for a long time and have been doing it across the Commonwealth um, and are professionals. And that's why we hired them. We feel really confident that they know what they're doing and we're going to have a comprehensive plan in place to keep the kids safe. Um, one final question. Uh, I mean, you, you clearly looked at this from all angles, not just you, but, but your team really has looked at this from all angles. Uh, and are presenting the town with a plan that I think has the maximum chances for success and the maximum chances for include for enhancing the educational experience for those attending foster school. Um, what do you see as the biggest risk that you face uh, going forward? Uh, the biggest risk to not uh, not getting approval at town meeting or yeah yeah another well uh, whether or not you get. Um, my assumption is you're going to get approval of town meeting, but the biggest risk in terms of um, the the unknowns that you could that you might be encountering that could cause this prop this project either to significantly increase in cost, have material delays, or cause other real problems. Well, I I'd like to say that we the work that we've done over the last five years, uh, even before some of the members of the project team came on board. Um, has helped inform kind of where we are today. And that includes geotechnical borings to make sure that there's no ledge in that hill, right? Yep. We can yep. dig into it and we're not going to encounter ledge that might prolong or cost more. Um, um, you know, we know that the soils uh, are silty. Uh, it was a word that was used last night. Um, but we also know that we're going to remove that soil and we're going to take the fill from the hill and use that to build up the site. So it's gonna be improved footing um, for the new school. So, you know, we've done a number of things over years that have kind of led us to this point to eliminate those, um, those risks. Um, you know, we know that there's likely to be um, uh, abatement of hazardous materials in the building before it gets demolished. That's kind of a, an expected thing when you have a sure. 1951 building, um, but, those risks are factored in to the cost that's been allocated toward that um, in the project. Um, I guess I might suggest that the uncertainty of the bidding climate might be the biggest risk. Um, if we get bids that are significantly higher than the project budget that the MSBA approves, we can't go back to the MSBA. We as a town have to decide how we're going to move forward, whether that's going back to town meeting to increase that appropriation or value engineering more of the project uh, at the risk of cutting some necessary attributes. Um, what's the third option, Chris? Uh, redesign. Or redesigning entirely, which, which, could, which could totally derail and, and delay the project and then go to rebid. Um, so that I think that's the biggest risk. Um, the uncertainty of the bidding climate today. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, your question, your answers to the questions were extremely helpful. I appreciate it. Welcome. <clears throat> uh, thank you both, Joe and Liz. Uh, let me open it up for public comment or questions. Let me see if any member of the public would like to ask any questions. If you are interested in asking questions, please. Uh, just unmute, uh, raise your hand, uh, either virtually or physically. We'll call on you and direct all your comments to the chair. Bill, I think I see Dr. Gallo. Oh, Dr. Gallo. Dr. Gallo, good evening. If you could say your name and address, that'd be great. Good to see you tonight. Yes, uh, Dorothy Gallo, One Volunteer Road. Um, and I just want to build on a couple of responses that Ray made. Um, 
great presentation by a committee that started before I retired and probably one of the hardest working longest committees that we've uh, that we've had in a long, long time. So kudos to what they've done. And I have nothing but support for the, uh, the project and the efforts. I would say that, you know, this whole issue of building a school on a site that's going to be occupied is something we've done before. Ray mentioned the middle school, but also back around 2000 when the high school and South School were projects that were simultaneously managed. Um, and one was a renovation and, and the high school was a huge renovation and addition and so on. And so, so the, the people that help us through that, the phasing that those projects sometimes require uh, do a terrific job. And I know that that kind of uh, work happening on site that's occupied is one of the biggest concerns parents have. So, you know, I would like to um, make sure that parents understand as we're talking about this, that not only are these, uh, these things well planned and engineered, but in terms of uh, the phasing and protecting kids and uh, changing directions along the way is, requires a lot of work with the school staff and also some monitoring, but there are good good people doing that work and that planning. So that is something that concerns parents and and and, and we've done it and it's worked well and we haven't had uh, any uh, any issues uh, in either of those directions. The idea of uh, an occupied site and the idea of phasing of the project. Uh, phasing of the project was something we had to do at the middle school. Um, as well, we've worked with, uh, the, at the middle school, we had significant issues in terms of the conservation uh, concerns and, and had to make changes because that site, because it was occupied, we had to move the new school over to a corner of the building, which was near the waterways. And so that's another thing that we've had good success with. And, and that's one of the things that I think people worry about a lot, but, but I, I lived through it. The kids we had lived through it. The staff, everybody had to work a bit harder, but uh, but we got it done. Um, the second thing that I would say is that when we look at the enrollment, I think people tend to to, to look at well, six hundred kids, you only have four hundred now. Where uh, are we? Are we hoping that all two hundred of the students who who are here another time are going to come back? No, we hope that we some of them will. But remember, there are new programs in that building that aren't there now that will bring children. And in some cases, the children that uh, are here, the pre-K pre -K program is, is a good example. So I think you have to look at that enrollment from uh, several aspects. And it's not just a number of people will move in and they'll all have to move into foster. One of the things that foster does allow us because the size that it is, is if we have an influx, either um, more people moving in with kids or, or kids returning or whatever it is, that's gonna happen across the district, not just in one school. And if it does happen across the district and we have to reallocate some kids redistricting, it would be called, not a nice thing to have to do, but it does give us space to uh, look at some pop-up populations or some shift in populations in other areas. So, so starting out, uh, the two most recent programs we've done, which is East School and, um, and, and the Middle School, where I mentioned the Middle School, um, they were bigger when on day one than our design popular our design number was bigger on day one. And so here, um, I don't think that we'll be bigger on day one, but um, I have no reason to think that we won't be at that population, but it will be not because people just moved in and they moved into the foster district. But anyway, good job by, by everyone. Dr. Gallo, thank you very much. See if anybody else has any questions or comments. You can just raise your hand virtually or physically. All right, I don't see anyone. So let me uh, just, uh, Linda, Ray, and your team, thank you very much. I know you have spent countless hours um, on this project and certainly know there's a lot of work heady as well between now and special town meeting. So 
Thanks so much for your presentation this evening. Thank you for your time. And I think Thank you have over to advisory. Yep. Thank you. Have a good Thank evening. You. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is a discussion of financing considerations related to debt exclusions for foster school and the public safety facility, including discussion of Article C, the transfer of unassigned fund balance to new stabilization fund. I know we have Tom and Michelle um, going to walk us through this, but I'll turn it over to Tom to start. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Michelle, if you want to, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so this is just an introduction uh, to some financing considerations that we'll be undertaking over the next um, several or the next few weeks, two two plus weeks, uh, before we're able to bring back to the town a um, an anticipated um, uh, tax impact analysis. So we want everyone to understand our process and what we'll be looking at. Uh, Michelle, if you wanna. Thank you. So I think, you know, as we just heard from Ray and his team, that uh, we're, we'll be asking the community uh, in the near future to, uh, to consider some important infrastructure investments. Um, you know, tonight in, in the next couple of slides, next several slides, we're gonna, I've asked Michelle to walk us all through the decision-making process that is gonna lead up to the recommendation from the finance team uh, to the select board which will uh, to identify the, the best way to estimate the tax impact uh, to the public while ensuring that the town's strong financial position, historically very strong financial position, is in fact maintained. Um, it is important to note that this recommendation will result in an, in an anticipated tax impact. Uh, of course, the actual tax impact will be determined by decisions made at the time of the actual borrowing uh, in the springs of 23, 24, and 25. Michelle. So just real quickly, uh, this is, you can see here, this is the, the team that will be doing this work. Uh, they are a robust team. Uh, they'll be led by Michelle um, and they'll work through the process that I just outlined. Um, you know, I, just so you all know, I see this uh, organization uh, of, of this particular team as the strength of our new staffing structure. And, uh, and I certainly know that this team, as I, as I said earlier, led by Michelle, uh, will get to the best possible financing solution for the town. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Michelle and let her walk us through some of the considerations we have coming up. Tom? Right. Oh. Yes, oh. sir. If you can just go back one slide. Yep. Um, is this a, an official um, title for John Asher, the financial <laughs> model mechanic? That was... Um, very we were back and forth on that one several different times, but that's the best clever. we can come up with, and one I think he'd appreciate. <laughs> okay, go ahead. All right, thank you, Tom. Yep. Um, so I wanted to just back up for a second and talk about the debt exclusion process. Um, just to remind everyone, a debt exclusion is a temporary tax increase that's used to fund specific capital projects. That's what we're doing this fall with these two projects. Um, essentially, the town borrows money to pay for large projects like a building, a new building, um, like a school or a public safety facility, because those expenditures are not something that we can fit into the normal budget. So as we pay those projects off over the course of several years, we um, during that time, those debt service payments are made from taxes. Um, again, this is not a permanent tax increase. It ends when that project debt is retired. And it's called a debt exclusion because it's excluded from the limits of Prop 2.5, which normally limits the town to only raising um, taxes by 2.5% each year. But unlike an override, which is the other um, voter approved tax increase under Prop 2.5, this is temporary. So it doesn't become part of the base in future years. It's really just for the life of the project. Um, and as you guys know, it's a two step approval process that requires both a town meeting vote and a ballot vote. And those are scheduled for November for the two projects that we're talking about. Um, the first thing that we need to know in evaluating how to finance the projects uh, is how much they cost. And as we've heard tonight, and also at last week's meeting, the estimated foster school project cost for the town's contribution is 88 million. And then for the public safety facility, it's about 46 million. So we're looking at a combined anticipated borrowing, um, a total of 134 million for these two projects. 
So in evaluating how we should structure the debt for these large capital projects, there's a lot of considerations that our whole finance team, as Tom mentioned, is working on. Um, these are in no particular order, and there's probably other ones, but there are 12 that I'm going to talk about tonight briefly. The first one on the list is the cash flows for the project. So this is all about timing. We have to make sure that we're borrowing enough money um, to cover the project costs in different periods. So this informs how much we'll borrow when. As you know, the town typically borrows each May, um, and the debt service on that borrowing would then be paid or start to be paid the following fiscal year. So whatever we borrow in the spring of 2023 would start to be repaid in FY24. If these projects move forward this fall, we'll likely need to borrow in May of 23, May of 24, and May of 25, depending on the construction schedules. It's kind of nice because both of them have about the same construction timeline, so they're, they're grouped together. Um, in addition, in talking with the project OPMs and with capital markets advisors and our finance team, we may actually need to do an interim borrowing this fall to make sure that we have enough cash to get through November of 22 to when we would typically borrow in May of 23. Um, so we're working with the project OPMs on that. Another consideration is bans versus bonds. So bans or bond anticipation notes are, are short-term um, debt instruments that the town issues usually for one year. Um, we only need to pay interest on bans for the first year and for the second year when you roll projects over, but by the time it comes around to the third year of using a ban for a project, then we have to start paying down principal as well. But typically with the ban, um, you, you have smaller debt service costs up front for that reason, but you're only locking in an interest rate for that short period of one year. The town typically follows like a ban, ban, bond model where we, we borrow short term for the first few years and then go long term. That may be the approach we take here, but it will depend on a number of these factors. So that's something we're um, considering. And part of that discussion is about what do the interest rates look like? So you see in this table to the right here, the interest rates as of yesterday from Capital Markets Advisors for a town like Hingham, that's rated AAA, the highest credit rating um, and is issuing tax exempt debt. So these are still good for historically low rates, but they're a little bit different than what we've seen in the last few years. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, the next one is credit rating. So the, as you know, the town's worked hard for 20 years to maintain its AAA credit rating, which is the highest from all three rating agencies. This allows us to maintain access to the market even when economic conditions are maybe not favorable. Um, it also allows us to secure the best possible interest rates when we're paying for these big capital projects. Um, one thing that's different is the town hasn't typically needed to get a rating on its bands. We, the, the AAA rating is related to the long-term bonds, but Capital Markets Advisors is actually seeing that there's a value in getting the short-term notes rated that would save us some interest costs. So that may be something that we need to work into the plan for the spring. Um, the rating agencies use a completely different rating scale for the band, so it's not AAA. Moody's uses MIG-1, for example. S&P has S&P-1 and Fitch has F-1, so it's a completely different rating, um, and we'll be looking at that. But we want to make sure when we're structuring this debt that we're preserv preserving our ratings um, and making sure that the rating agencies are viewing all of our plans in a positive light. We did talk about... Um, we talked with CMA about the rating agencies viewing debt exclusions as credit positive because that's essentially the community voting affirmatively to make these investments in its infrastructure. Um, another consideration here is competitive versus negotiating sales. Uh, typically the town does a competitive sale, which usually assures the lowest interest rates, but sometimes there are circumstances that warrant doing um, a negotiated sale. The most recent example and the only one that I know of is for the water company. Um, where you have a new entity that doesn't really have a credit um, history because the town was taking it over and kind of starting from scratch from a revenue perspective. So that was one where we, we did a negotiated sale to make sure that the terms were very favorable to us. And that helped us lock in some of the lowest rates, um, the historically low rates for the town on that debt. One that we talk about often is the term. Um, so the town typically borrows for 20 years for large capital projects, but we can borrow up to a maximum of 30 years for these two building projects. Um, it may make sense to borrow for a longer period of time because of the size of these projects. But again, that's something that we're evaluating with the team. And then the repayment structure is another one we talk about a lot, level principal versus level payment repayments. 
with level principal, you, sit, you pay the same amount of principal back per year with decreasing interest costs. So on one hand, you're, you're paying more of the debt up front. So people in Hingham now would bear a larger cost of the project than people in town 10 or 15 years from now. But overall, you pay less for the project because the interest is lower. On the other hand is level payment, which is much more like most people's mortgages, where you pay the same amount each year for the life of the project, um, but the principal and interest within that amount each year varies. And sometimes that makes it a little bit easier to budget and for people to absorb, but it does mean that the town would pay more overall for the project in terms of interest. Um, in talking with Bond Council and CMA last week, they did note, we asked, you know, what are other communities typically doing for these large projects? And they said that most communities are doing a 30-year 30, 30 level payment structure just because of the size of the projects. Again, something we'll consider. Also, in light of the next consideration, our town financial policy. The financial policy is available online, and it has a whole section that focuses on debt service with some guidelines and recommendations in there. So we need to look at that closely with the financial team as well. This slide talks about our debt capacity. Um, by statute, the town has a debt limit that we cannot exceed. So we can't issue or have outstanding at any particular time more than 5% of the total taxable property in town, which is about $8 billion. So that leaves our current debt limit as of last year at 397 million and about 354 million is available. Um, there are certain things that are not included in this, like the water company um, acquisition debt is not included, and neither will the foster debt. Both of those are outside of this formal debt limit. So um, of the 134 million I mentioned a few slides ago, only the 46 million associated with the public safety facility would actually count towards this debt limit. Um, but that's there are other capacities that we need to be mindful of. One is future capital projects. What else is coming down the pipeline and what's the timing of that and what will the tax impact be? We need to make sure that what we're structuring now leaves room for the town to make future investments in, in however many years. Um, and then another piece of it, which you see graphed here at the bottom is the existing excluded debt. So what are we already still paying for? There's four projects that are currently still on our schedule, which means they're still coming out of tax bills. Um, and you can see here over time, as some of those projects are retired, like particularly some debt retires, I believe it's e-school in, in 28 is the last year. So you see some capacity built into 29. So as we come up with these different scenarios with capital markets advisors to bring back to the board, we'll layer in on top of this, um, how the public safety facility and foster debt might look. So you can see um, you know, what type of increase in which years it would land. And then finally, Market conditions is an obvious one. What are interest rates doing? What's the economy doing? It's really hard to have a crystal ball here, but this is where we work very closely with our financial advisors. Um, as Tom mentioned in the beginning, we're coming up with a recommended approach right now. This is what we anticipate doing, but every time we actually go to borrow in the next three springs, we're gonna need to reevaluate not just the market conditions, but a lot of these considerations to make sure that we're doing what's best for the town at that point in time. And, and you know how quickly the market's changed recently in the last few months or years. So we're, we're keeping an eye on that. Um, there's always legal restrictions. We wanna make sure that we're doing everything correctly um, and in line with any up-to-date guidance that's issued by the state's Department of Revenue. And we rely on bond counsel for a lot of those considerations. The taxpayer impact. This is a very important one and probably the, the one that most people care about. How much are these projects gonna cost me as a taxpayer and, and what value am I getting for them? Um, so this is one that when we come back to the board in a few weeks with our recommended approach, we'll be able to, to discuss the estimated tax impact. We'll put up different graphs um, and we'll, we'll do that keeping in mind that we're also proposing an override this spring and that that will also have an estimated tax impact. Um, finally, the last in this list is the use of unassigned fund balance to offset the tax impact of these two projects. Um, so that leads me to Article C. So the text of Article C is on this side. This is the third article that we're proposing for town meeting. And this is all about, um, the town has said for many years that we're saving a lot of our unassigned fund balance for the purpose of offsetting ta the tax impact of large capital projects like Foster School and the public safety facility. So this article basically makes good on that plan by formally setting aside a portion of unassigned fund balance 
into a new stabilization fund that we're proposing to set up here. We're calling it the Capital Project Costs and Debt Service Stabilization Fund. Um, we wanna do, the town already has a stabilization fund, but we think it's important to keep these monies segregated and make sure that what we set aside through this fund doesn't get commingled um, with the other funds that we have in the existing stabilization fund. It just makes it cleaner from an accounting perspective. Um, but essentially we would create this new fund, move some of the unassigned fund balance into it, and then town meeting in the future, um, we would propose taking it out of the fund and using it to pay some of the debt service costs, particularly in the early years when the long-term debt service hits people's bills. Um, that would help kind of blunt the initial impact of these two projects and help us kind of smooth that initial increase. So that's something also when we come back that we'll be able to show graphically and, and might um, make it clearer for people. And again, town meeting would need to approve the use of the stabilization funds in the future. We will, we will recommend a certain amount be moved aside into that account this fall. You can always add more to it in the future. So if we wanted to contribute more next spring or the spring after that, depending on what our fund balance looks like, we can do that. Um, and then one really important tool that our team is using in making all of these decisions is a financial planning model that was developed by John Asher, our model mechanic, um, which this has been incredibly helpful and incredibly valuable. He had created this um, with some other folks a few years ago, and there's an earlier version of it available on the website um, with the Sustainable Budget Task Force Report. This one will also be on the website. We're still just tweaking the numbers, so it will be there in, in another week or so. Um, but this, as you can see, allows us to play with a number of variables, so we can kind of look at different scenarios. We can play with I mean, the cost of the projects aren't really changing, but based on the cash flows, we can borrow different amounts at different times. We can play with the 20, 25, 30 year um, horizons for repaying the debt. We can look at what a level principal versus a level payment structure does, put in different amounts for the operating override to see that tax impact, um, even though we're still working on the FY24 forecast. Um, and then you can also, depending on your assessed value, you can put in different assessed values to look at what it might cost you. Um, and he just added functionality, of course he could, um, so that we can play with the use of the unassigned fund balance to offset the tax impact. This is a really complicated model. We recognize that most people probably just want a quick calculator to see what something might cost them. So we're also working on that, but this has been incredibly helpful for our team to kind of crunch different numbers um, and look at these different scenarios. So thank you, John. In terms of next steps, um, we will be working with CMA. They are making some scenarios for us that are mostly looking at um, the current debt that we've got out there and layering on top of it, um, these scenarios with the 20 versus 30 years, the level principal level payment. Those are options that we're going to wanna discuss individually with the three select board members and kind of come closer to a recommended approach. We will work with John Asher to finalize the financial planning model and also to translate that into developing this simple tax impact tool um, that him and Kate Richardson are already working on that will allow people again to just put their address in and see what foster, what the public safety facility and what an override in the spring of 24 might look like in terms of a tax impact for them. The override is not yet determined, so we're at least gonna start with what the current deficit is for FY24 and we'll look at um, how we might make that clear for folks. Um, so then we'll return in likely in mid-September with all these numbers firmed up um, and some more charts and we'll, we'll come back to the board and present some more specifics at that time. I think that's it for me and Tom. Happy to entertain any questions. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. Um, and as you ended um, on the point you ended with, so we're going to come back and have a, uh, have another meeting in mid-September where we can give uh, residents and taxpayers some more specific information about numbers and what anticipated tax increases will be, correct? Yes, that's right. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate the overview. All right, in this item, let's, uh, let's go to Joe first for questions. Great. Uh, can you go back to the slide which had that $88 million on it? It was way back. Um, yes, yeah, so could you just help me to understand where this 88 million is coming from? Yes, yeah, so that's um, based on the numbers that we heard from Ray this evening. 
that's the town's estimated share of the foster project. So although we need to get authorization from town meeting for the full 113 million for MSBA purposes, um, we'll be working with their team and with Aisha closely so that we don't actually borrow more than we need for the project so that we're not paying debt service on funds that we didn't need. So it's um, we'll work with them to manage kind of the, the cash reimbursements for that project to make sure that the full 113 will be available, but that people, you know, taxes are only paying back the portion that we think will be responsible for. Right, because I, I had thought that MSB requires the town to fund the full 113 um, and then they will pay us back on the 25. So I believe they were, and, and this may be one where, where Rick or others want to jump in, but I believe we have to get authorization for the full project amount. I don't think we have to actually borrow the full amount. So that, that's correct. This is Rick. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the the uh, the MSBA uh, wants you to approve the whole project budget, so you know of of course that gives you the authority to sign the contract because it, you show that you have a, a full appropriation, and then um, the vote will say uh, in their language that the amount to be borrowed will be reduced to the extent of uh, the the grant that's set forth in the project funding agreement. So uh, effectively. You're just borrowing the net share at the end of the day, and they're pretty good about sending the uh, cash back to the town uh, as costs are paid, so that in, in real time the monies are available to kind of recycle okay. and pay additional costs to assist with cash flow. Great. So it's not as if we get the 25 million after we've paid everything. It's 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 actually it's a rolling reimbursement uh, month to month. Is that is that fair? That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so let me see, uh, Michelle, you went over the level principal versus the level payment. Mm -hmm. Um, does that decision itself have an impact on the interest rate that we pay? Not the amount, not the dollar amount of the interest, but the interest rate. I don't think so, but I'd rather ask, um, CMA to weigh in on that. And I know Janice, I hear tonight. I'd rather double check that answer and get back to you. Okay. And also, you know, the 30 year versus the 20 year, what impact that has on the interest rate. Um, that just be helpful, helpful to understand. On that one, just based on what um, they advise us, the rates were as of yesterday on the side, yeah. you can see that the 20 year bond yeah. rate here is slightly lower than the 30 year, just meaning that people get paid their money back quicker. So maybe that's worth. Right. Okay. Um, and then I want to talk about the use of assigned fund balance. Um, so, I mean, there are two possible uses. One, you could actually use the fund balance to decrease the amount that we're borrowing. Mm -hmm. You just have to borrow, or we can not use it to decrease the amount that we're borrowing, but to smooth out the tax impact, to, to offset the tax impact, um, which will not benefit the town in terms of we'll be paying more interest versus using the fund balance to actually reduce the amount that we borrow. Um, but I understand that there's the benefit to the residents of that smoothing process. But have you looked at the, the amount of interest that we will be, the increased interest that we'll be paying by using fund balance in the way you're suggesting? We can look at that. And I think a lot of that will also depend on those other two main factors and how we structure it. The 20 versus the 30 year and the level principal yep. versus level payment really impacts the amount of interest that the town will pay. Um, so we will look at that, but we were leaning towards um, using it this way of, of paying back a portion of the debt service because people will, that's a direct um, benefit to people in the first few years when it's, when it's the biggest increase and will feel people will feel it the most in their bills. Um, if we do say we're talking about $6 million here and we're borrowing um, 138,000 instead of 146, when you amortize that over 20 or 30 years in terms of right. people feeling it, I just don't, they, they won't. Um, but we can look at the interest costs like you're mentioning. Got it. Um, and then finally, I know this is top of mind for you and for your team, but 
just making sure that we focus on a strategy to help the town maintain its AAA bond rating. Um, and so to the extent that this board needs to be taking action or looking at proposals uh, that will strengthen our position before the rating agencies, I just wanna make sure that you present it to us so that we can act on it. Absolutely. Great, thank you, that's it. Thanks, Joe, let me turn to Liz. Great, thanks, Bill. And thank you, Joe, for asking about the estimated borrowing. I think it's important for people to understand that the number in the appropriation in the, the vote language um, at town meeting and the ballot is different than actually what we'll be borrowing um, because we are expecting that 25 million from MSBA. So that's an important distinction. Um, one thing I was thinking about related to the, the AAA bond rating is um, it would be interesting to show people, Michelle, what the interest rates would be if we didn't have that credit rating. Um, so maybe for next time we can just we can show that too. Um, and then whatever we need to do to, to do the um, the ban ratings um, will be interesting too. Um, in terms of the scenarios, do you have an idea of what those scenarios will look like? Um, you know, is the 20 year, 30 year, maybe different interest rates? Um, you know, if it's three and a half, but maybe, you know, then there's another scenario that the interest rate is a little lower, another scenario, the interest rate is a little higher, just so we can kind of communicate what the range might be, since it's not an exact number, um, mm -hmm. or it is at that moment in time, but not since we're not borrowing on the, the exact day we're going to be presenting, just so people understand the range um, and, and what we're kind of committing to theoretically. Yep, I think um, I think what you'll see is like charts that show our existing excluded debt on the bottom, and then probably four main scenarios where um, it is like the twenty-year level principal, twenty-year level payment, thirty-year level principal, thirty-year level payment layered on top of this. Um, those will have some interest rate assumptions that are kind of based on now, but then maybe we can show with whatever the recommended structure is, a range of interest rates too, to kind of say, if the market gets better, it could be this low. If it gets worse, it could be this high. I mean, I think what we've got in the model here is kind of based on um, what CMA is seeing today and then conservatively adding um, a certain percentage every few years over time, um, kind of assuming that things will, will go up. But yes, right. we can show a range and we're hoping to, to have some of that information to be able to talk with you guys and CMA next week. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah, I think I think that would be helpful. Um, and what you mentioned the um, future capital projects, which is certainly an important consideration. Who's responsible for kind of creating that schedule? I think our office would probably take the lead on on talking with the different parties. There's some that we know are on the you know the short term, like the Harbor Wharf Wall improvements that we've already gotten some town town meeting authorization for the senior center most likely but then if we're talking about you know the next 20 or 30 years there's a number of other things coming down the pipeline that we would really need to talk with a lot of people and, and figure out what the right order and expected time frame might be mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Tom wants to add anything to that just that some of those people that we will be talking to will include you <laughs> Liz <laughs> Liz Joe Bill all of yeah. you folks uh, will be front and center in that conversation right the, there's a lot of ass, a lot of infrastructure needs in a town this size um it's ongoing and we need to work together to understand um what the leaders want in terms of prioritization for those mm -hmm. for those assets so Yes, definitely. I, th I think it makes a sense for us to do as a board. And it's something I think we all want to get better at is do that kind of long term capital planning. Um, and in specific to this, it just helps give the taxpayers, I think, a more holistic view of, of what's happening and what the tax impact is over not just the short term, but the long term. So, OK, um, that's it for me for now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Liz. Let me see if anybody from the public has any uh, questions or comments. All right, strolling through here. I don't see anyone. If anyone does, please raise your hand virtually or physically and I'll call on you. Okay, 
I don't see anybody with their hand raised. All right, um, as noted, um, this, this is our kind of initial discussion on the financing considerations. We will have uh, future discussions on this topic and we expect to give everyone some little more specific information um, in September. So I wanna thank you, Michelle, for your hard work on the presentation. I know you put a lot of time into it. Thank you as well, Tom. Yes, thank, thank you. you, John Asher. Always thank you, John Asher. Thank you, John. <laughs> good to see you. The mechanic. Okay. It's it's good to be back in daylight again. Michelle didn't let me out of the engine room, so I'm glad. <laughs> I'm there. You have grease on your hands. <laughs> John loves the engine room. <laughs> All right, next item on the agenda is to consider the first amendment to the project funding agreement with the Massachusetts School Building Authority for the Plymouth River Elementary School project. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Aisha. Yes, thank you. Um, Aisha, so how are you tonight? I'm good, thank you. Good. So we, um, in terms of the, um, the PRS Plymouth River School project for the windows, just to let you know that building, that project has been moving along very smoothly. Um, in terms of budgets, that, that project has been going along very well as well. Um, we still have about 600000 left as part of a contingency amount left over in, budget, in, the, in the budget. And in terms of um, this presentation tonight, we also have Donald Valusa, who's also the project manager, manager joining the call as well. So in case you have any other questions, he's also here joining us, who's a project manager for the PRS Windows project. Um, in terms of the amendment that we submitted for your approval, um, this document um, actually reflects changes as a result of bid, the bids that have gone out and the change in the price, the prices of, of, um, the, of the various items on the budget here based on the bid results. So we see that the bid results actually came back at a lower amount. The original amount that we would have approved um, before would have been about 3.7 million. And now we're down to about 3.3 million on this project. So we're very excited about that. And we're happy to um, present this amendment to the budget, which MSA requires us to get from you and approval from you as well. Aisha, thank you very much. Let me turn it over to my colleagues for question. And I'll, I'll turn to Liz. Uh, thank you, Aisha. Um, so not really a question, just confirming um, that it, it is a reduction in cost and there's no additional cost to the town. Exactly. You're right. right. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Sign it quick, Bill. <laughs> Can't, I got to go to Joe first for his question. <laughs> okay, let me not mess it up. So I'm looking at the attachment. And so there's the July 6, 2022, which shows a total project budget of the 3.99 million. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the comparable one that shows the reduction. So the one in your package should also, it should also show um, the proposed revised PFA budget of 3.383. Yes, I see that. Yes. Okay, so, so that, got that's it. That's where we are right now, yes. Okay. Um, looks great. No other questions. Thank you. Thank okay. you for your efforts here. Okay. I guess I do have one other question, Bill. Yeah, um, sure, go ahead. Do you expect any other amendments or it, will the project be is pretty near completion at this point? So at this point, the only um, questions that we have that have come up are with regards to, for example, um, the project is going very well, um, just to say, but um, in terms of we have a few back order issues, for like doors, and other, and other and for doors specifically, where we um, we expect that these doors will come in in October, um, um, just because you are on back order, like everything else is happening <laughs> in this environment. Um, but the, the the contractors as well as the project manager has assured us that they will be able to work um, overnight once those doors come in to put those in place, and those costs will be borne by them in terms of putting those through. So we don't foresee any changes at this moment, but then um, that's exactly where we are right now. Okay, great. And Thank we do you. have the contingency amount baked into there, which is about 600,000. So we definitely don't see an, a, an increase from there Okay. with that contingency amount. Great. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, uh, Liz and Joe. Let me see if anybody from public has any questions or comments. All right, seeing none, I would entertain a motion. I will make a motion to authorize the chair to execute the first amendment to the project funding agreement between the town of Hingham and the Massachusetts School Building Authority for the Plymouth River Elementary School, MSBA project number 202001310019. Second. Motion made and seconded. Is there a need for further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor by roll call vote, Liz. Aye. Joe. Aye. And I'm an eye as well. The motion carries. Aisha, thanks very much for your time tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Take care. Next item on the agenda is to appoint uh, James Brady as a permanent police sergeant for the town of Hingham. Uh, sergeant Brady has been an acting sergeant for almost a year and a half now, I think. But let me turn it over to Chief Jones to give us some background on this pending appointment. Good evening, Bill, and thanks for the opportunity to address the board tonight. I come before you to request that Sergeant James Brady be appointed to his position on a permanent basis. Sergeant Brady was appointed to the rank of Sergeant in a temporary full-time capacity in April of 21 uh, by this board. The position was given the civil service temporary designation as a result of having a Sergeant vacancy uh, due to a pending retirement. Since then, that pending retirement was approved uh, allowing this board to consider uh, this promotion uh, to a permanent basis. As a way of background, Sergeant Brady was appointed as a Hingham police officer in 2013. He's taken on a number of progressive roles within the department. He served in the traffic division, he served as a field training officer, a firearms instructor, and also heads up our Citizens Police Academy program at Linden Ponds and serves on the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council as a SWAT team member. Sergeant Brady is a natural leader and has mentored all of our newer and veteran officers in his various roles. He's currently assigned as the patrol sergeant on the 4 p.m. to midnight shift, where he's brought his expertise and shown a tremendous talent at keeping his staff motivated and educated in all areas in the evolving field of policing. I'm pleased to ask the board to consider making the appointment of permanent full-time sergeant to James Brady, and I'm obviously happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks very much. All right, Chief, thanks very much. Uh, I don't have any questions, but just a quick comment. I um, want to note for the record that uh, Sergeant Brady has done a fantastic job um, in the, the almost year and a half he has been an acting sergeant, and he is um, a fantastic police officer, and he's a credit to our town. So I am uh, very happy to endorse your recommendation tonight, Chief. Let me go to my colleagues and I'll open up to Liz first. Thanks, Bill. Um, I don't have any questions either. I'm I'm thrilled to see um, that that Officer Brady has done so well in the temporary role and, and definitely support um, this permanent promotion. Joe. Yeah. Yes, um, so I've reviewed uh, Sergeant Brady's performance with the chief prior to this meeting. Uh, I fully support moving forward and um, look forward to, actually, I was gonna ask a question. Is there a new swearing in after he's appointed to this position since he's already been sworn in before or do we have a new ceremony for him? That's a great question. So he, he already was sworn in uh, as a Sergeant. So uh, if this uh, appointment is made tonight, he would not be re-sworn in since he already is sworn in as a Sergeant. So we need to find another way just to uh, confirm our congratulations. Um, if not at that ceremony, someplace else. But I've got uh, no questions. I, I believe he's on the line if you want to uh, <laughs> say anything to him. Okay. Well, we can actually, I'll leave it to our chair, but maybe give him a chance to speak as well. Great. Uh, Jimmy, I'll give you a chance to speak after the vote. I know you asked to speak tonight. So um, we'll, uh, we'll we'll take the vote first and then I'll, I'll uh, recognize you. Um, all right. Um, it's a personnel appointment. Not going to take any 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 uh, public comment on this uh, on this issue. Let me turn to my colleagues for motion. I make a motion to appoint James Brady as a permanent police sergeant for the town of Ingham. Second. Motion made and seconded. Need further discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor by real call vote. Joe. Aye. 
Liz. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So the motion carries unanimously. So uh, congratulations, Jimmy. And um, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, good, e good evening, everybody. Um, I just really want to thank the board for uh, this recognition and uh, the chief, the deputy, mm -hmm. the and everyone at the department for this consideration. Um, I really look forward to being able to continue in this role within the department and to serve the department in the town. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, and uh, thank you for your service to the town. Thank you. All right, Chief, good to see you. Thank you, you as well. All right, next item on the agenda is to consider the request of uh, Bertucci's Restaurant LLC doing business as Bertucci's Brick Oven Restaurante, 90 Derby Street, Hingham, Hingham Massachusetts, for a change of manager. And I believe we have Mr. Adam uh, Rem, uh, Remeska on the line. Okay, we might not have Adam, but do we have someone in Adam's place to speak on the on the request? I don't see them here. Uh, I can tell you generally if you'd like me to, Bill. Um, sure, if you want. I mean, I normally we, we would have the applicant yeah. do a presentation. Um, so I'm inclined to probably continue the matter unless it's oh, a okay. pressing matter that needs to be acted on tonight. What do you What are your thoughts, Tom? Um, I'm just checking over the 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 application the certification real quick. Hold on a second. I just don't want them to have to stop functioning. Um, <clears throat> Chief, do you happen to know offhand if if this were to be continued today, is that going to cause significant hardship to Bertucci's or? I don't believe it will. They should be able to continue to operate under their existing license. Um, it's just a transfer. Uh, of that license. I, I think that's right, Bill. I, I don't um, I don't see a reason why that would cause them to not be able to function. Okay, but it's normally our practice that when we take yeah. actions of this item that the, the applicant does uh, does appear and make a presentation in some some capacity. So I am inclined to continue the motion uh, the matter to next week. We are going to meet next week, likely on yeah. Wednesday night. So we'll just uh, hold this over to next week. Um, if there's an issue, Tom, let us know. We can we can take appropriate action. Will do. Okay. All right. Uh, moving to item nine on the agenda is to consider a request for a special one-day wine and malt beverages license to the McCourt Foundation for the 13th annual Tour de South Shore Athletic Facility to be held at Wampatuck State Park on Sunday, September 25th, 2022 from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. And I believe we have Joe uh, Castellanata on the phone. There's Joe right there. Joe, good to see you again. How you doing, sir? All right, tell us a little about the event. Yes, thank you very much. So we have a 25 and 50 mile bike ride toward the South Shore starting and ending in Wampatuck State Park, uh, going through Norwell, Situate, Cohasset, and back to Hingham. Um, we'll be operating out of the visitor center at 204 Union Street within Wampatuck State Park, uh, looking at about 200 participants and uh, just a little celebration at the end. Joe, my, my uh, recollection is you did this last year and it proved to be pretty successful, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Um, before I turn it over to Joe and Liz for questions or comments, Tom, any concerns expressed to you by the police department or any any uh, anything we need to be concerned about with this application? No, we have communication from the chief that all is uh, all is good with this application. Fantastic. All right, um, Joe. Any questions? Uh, I've got no no questions. I'm fully supportive of this application. Although I will ask uh, one question. Uh, this is known as the Tour to South Shore. Uh, will uh, French speaking be required uh, <laughs> as, it, as it is in the Tour de France? <laughs> uh no optional sir uh, okay okay uh but no i th i think this is this is uh excellent um and it's a great fun way to raise money for uh neurologic research so thank you thank you very much liz 
No questions. I'm familiar with the event and the application looks complete. I think I did see a note from Chief Jones about having a detail. So I imagine that's being worked out. It is. Great. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, does anybody uh, in the public have any questions or comments about this application? Seeing none, I take a motion. I will make a motion to approve the request for a special one day wine and malt beverages license to the McCourt Down Foundation for the 13th annual Tour de South Shore Athletic Festival to be held on Sunday, September 25th, 2022, from 7 30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Second. Motion made and seconded. Is there a need for further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor by roll call vote. Liz. Bill, just one thing. The um I, the event times, I think, I believe are 7.30 to 1, but the the liquor, the license says 10 a.m. Because they're probably not serving right at 7.30. I don't know if we need to amend that. Joe, do you want, uh, let me see, Joe, Joe C., do you want to ask about, you want to comment on that? Yeah, 10 a.m. Um, everyone's checking in for the event at, at 7.30. Um, we'll start serving at 10 a.m. We'll be wrapped out. Uh, okay do you want me to redo it yeah why don't we just would you want to make a, a new motion with amended time? yes okay Thank you. i make a new mo amend that motion make a motion to approve the request for a special one day wine and malt beverages license to the mccourt foundation for the 13th annual tour de south shore athletic festival to be held on sunday september 25th 2022 from 10 a.m to 1 p.m second all right motion made and second and need for further discussion Hearing none, all those in favor by roll call vote. Liz. Aye. Joe. Aye. And I'm going to die as well. The motion carries. Joe, good luck with your event. Uh, Thank Bill, you very much. I, I just want to note there is no rain date for this. So it's September 25th, rain or shine. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Thanks. All right. Next item on the agenda is to consider. Uh, the request for a special one-day all-alcoholic beverages license to Hingham Maritime Center for Harbor Feast 2022 to be held at Hingham Maritime Center on Saturday, uh, September 10th, 2022, from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. I believe we have Marnie on the line today to do the presentation. Marnie, good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, yes, we are back to holding our annual um, event, Harbor Feast, after a two-year hiatus. Um, the event will be uh, in conjunction with the Hingham High School rowing and sailing teams this year, which is exciting. Um, we will have a police detail, which I need to request. And my predecessor said to do that two weeks before the event. So we'll be doing that. Um, and, um, and that's it. Barney, it's good to see your event um, taking place again. I know it's been a couple of years because of COVID and everything we're dealing with. So that's great. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful event at the Maritime Center. Tom, any administrative matters we need to uh, be wary of? Nope. Nope. This is all, all in order. All right. Any questions? Joe? Uh, no questions. I absolutely support this. It should be a wonderful event. And Liz? Uh, no questions. Application looked complete, and I know it's a wonderful event. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you all. Do any members of the public have any questions? Seeing none, I take a motion. I move to approve the request for a special one day all alcoholic beverages license to Hingham Maritime Center for Harbor Feast 2022 to be held at Hingham Maritime Center on Saturday, September 10th, 2022, from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Second. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor by roll call vote. Joe. Aye. Liz. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. The motion carries unanimously. Good luck, Marnie. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is to consider the request for a special one day wine and malt beverages license to WM Brewing Company Incorporated for the Ware River uh, Farm summer send off to be held on Saturday, August 27th, 2022, with a rain date of Sunday, August 28th, 2022, from 4 30 p.m. to 9 30 p.m. I believe we have uh, Colin Foley on the line tonight. Yes, sir. How are you doing? Good, Colin. How are you? Doing well. All right. Go ahead. Tell us a little about your event. Yeah. So this is uh, similar to the event we had at the beginning of the summer uh, with the trustees. Um, that one was held at World's End. Uh, I think it was a little bit bigger event, um, but I think they ran into some issues not being able to hold uh, this one at 
World's End, so they switched it to Ware River. Um, I believe there'll be some music. Um, we'd have uh, two of our senior tap room members uh, go there at Zippor. Um, I believe they have, um, I believe Chief Jones requested a uh, police detail for the event. Um, what else? And I know they're, um, they're going to have parking attendance for, for that end. Um, but it's pretty similar to the uh, picnics and other events that we've, uh, us and the other South Shore Brewers have done with the trustees. Colin, thank you. Ann, would you like to add anything to that? Um, no, this is, um, the band is called the Duppy Conquerors. They're a Bob Marley tribute band. Um, it's a Saturday night as opposed to our Thursday picnics. Um, and we've got about 230 people signed up right now. We're hoping for, we're hoping for about 300. 300, excellent. Uh, and just to clarify, Colin, WM Brewing is, um, Widowmaker Brewery, Brewery out of, uh, Braintree, correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. All right. Tom, any administrative concerns? Nope, I spoke with Sharon and all is good with this application. All right, Liz, any questions? Um, it looks like there is there is a rain date, the 28th. That's right. right. Hopefully we won't need to use it. Looks I know. like a good day on Saturday. Yes. Um, and you, I know you said you're hoping oh. for 300. So have you secured a police detail? I let Sergeant Kilroy know that I would be following up with him when we found out how many people were going to come. So I'll follow up with him this week. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay. Joe. No other questions. Any members of the public have any questions or concerns? Seeing none, I take a motion. Liz, is it me or you? I, I'll, I'll go. I'll make Let a motion to approve the request for a special one-day wine and malt beverages license to WM Brewing Company Incorporated for the Weir River Farm summer send-off to be held on Saturday, August 27, 2022, with a rain date of Sunday, August 28, 2022, from 4.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Second. Need for further discussion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor by roll call vote, Liz. Aye. Joe. Aye. And I'm an eye as well. The motion carries. All right. Good luck. Thank Colin, you. Good luck. Thank, you all. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is to consider the request for a special one day wine and malt beverages license to Worthy Village Incorporated for the Worth Village annual fundraiser to be held at the community center on Saturday, September 24th, 2022 from 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. I believe we have Lisa Rayberg on the line who's gonna do the presentation. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, Worthy Village is um, a, an organization that my daughter actually started about 10 years ago when she was in college. And they um, raise money for, <clears throat> excuse me, um, women and children in Guatemala, they provide clean water filters. They um, bring down groups of volunteers to go through the villages and provide clean water filters. We've had um, an annual fundraiser for the last, well, not the last two years, but three and four years previous to that um, in different locations, <clears throat> excuse me. And generally, you know, our donors will come lots of Rotary members, um, business community members. We're expecting somewhere around 125 people indoor event at the Hingham Community Center, which I'm very happy that we got that venue. They're doing their patio outside, and I think that we'll be one of the first groups to use it. So, um, and it's a really nice space. Um, and do you have, I don't know, what else do you want me to talk about? <laughs> That, that's a good overview. Uh, We're Lisa, serving so, dinner, food. There'll be, you know, raffles and fundraising and I'll invite you all. It promises to be a good night. Excellent. And Lisa, what's, what's your position uh, in the organization? Um, I'm the event planner. I'm, um, I don't hold a, a, you know, a board um, position. My husband's actually a board member. There are five other board members. Excellent. Well, it sounds like, uh, um, Fantastic organization. Thank Let you. me see if anybody has any questions. Joe. Uh, no questions. Liz. 
Excellent. Thanks, Bill. And thank you, Lisa. It sounds like a wonderful organization and a great fundraiser. Um, just one question, I guess, for you, Tom. Do we need a Corey check as part of the application? I don't think I saw that. We would uh, we would normally do that. If it's not in here, we will get it. Maybe um, I missed it. No, it's not in the attached documents. Uh, Chief Jones, do you remember seeing it as part of the packet? I don't recall seeing it in the original packet either, uh, Tom. All right. Uh, we have we must have it. If not, we'll get it. it. It won't. That's a minor thing. You can condition your vote perhaps to that. Successful passing of that. Um, if we needed one. Yeah, if we need one. How, 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 Joe, Liz, how do you feel about conditioning the vote? Um, so it's not clear. Do we need a, a, a Corey review for this? Chief, do you know, I mean, is a Corey review required? I, I, it would be up to the town to require uh, the Corey. Um, we just require the, the TIP certification is what we look for when approving the number of people and the uh, the venue uh, to be able to contain the, the um, people that they're serving. Um, I don't believe it's uh, it's necessary, maybe uh, some of the town generally does. So I'm just looking at the last application we did. I don't, yeah. I don't see a, I don't see a quarry as part of that as well. So we, we just, uh, I the think it's more just... for, the, for the managers. Okay. Not the yes. one days, but for the change of managers when there's an yeah. alcohol license involved. That That is definitely correct, Michelle. For those, you do need the, the Corey for the uh, new manager. Yeah, I mean, we just voted the FWM Brewing and I don't see a Corey there. Yeah, I was just going back to the same thing, Joe. I don't see it there either. Um, yeah, yeah like I... Michelle said, it must just be for the managers. Okay. But I, th I think Liz's point is is good. We should, you know, just make sure that I, I would not condition this vote, but I, Tom, if you could just double check and if in fact there is a requirement, you'll make sure it's enforced. Will do, yep. Okay. Okay, any members of the public have any questions? All right, seeing none, I take a motion. I move to approve the request for a special one day wine and malt beverages license to Worthy Village Inc. for the Worthy Village annual fundraiser to be held at the community center on Saturday, September 24th, 2022 from 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Second. All those in favor by roll call vote, Joe. Aye. Liz. Aye. Now I'm an aye as well, the motion carries. All right, Lisa, good luck. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. That's luck with your event. Thank you. All right, next on the item on the agenda is to consider approval of the agreement with the uh, Augers company for phase two of IT network switch replacements. And I see we have our IT expert, Bill Hardigan on the line. Bill, good evening. Good evening. All right. So this is uh, basically phase two of the project we came uh, before everybody with uh, back in March. We did phase one um, and you know, we had money appropriated town meeting uh, for phase two and that's appropriated. So we would like to get the order placed since there is a long lead time on the equipment. Um, we'd like, just like to get the order placed and this is uh, take care of the switches in all the non town hall complex buildings. So fire, police, DPW, Etc. Um, and that'll that'll round out that project, and getting new switches to all the buildings. All right, um, Bill. How long do you did you anticipate the additional work is going to take? Um, well, it all depends on when the <laughs> switches arrive. But um, some of those buildings are, are small, like uh, North and South Fire. They'll go very quickly. Um, they'll go. It'll go pretty quickly. We can schedule that. Obviously working in around the operations, um, like the country club, we'll have to work around some of those operations, but probably only take us um, probably two or three months to get it done. Thank you. Let me see if anybody has any questions. Uh, Liz. Just a, a question, Bill, how, how did phase one go? Are you happy with the, the service? Uh, I'll let you know in October when the switches arrive. <laughs> okay, so that hasn't happened yet. 
Okay. Now, but this is a company I've worked with in the past. Um, I'm very familiar with them. I, I know their engineers, um, so I don't anticipate any problems. Okay, great. And this is, we're still within the budget of what's been appropriated, correct? Correct, okay. correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Joe. You know, I was going to ask the budget question. Um, are these prices basically set so that um, we're not going to have a price increase after we've uh, taken the step? This locks us into these prices, absolutely. Great, okay, no questions, thank you. All right, anybody from the public have any questions? Okay, with that then, I will make the motion. Right. Make a motion to authorize the town administrator to sign the agreement with the Ockers Company for phase two IT network switch replacements in an amount not to exceed 119,000 $188.21. Second. All in favor by roll call vote. Joe. Aye. Liz. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. The motion carries. Bill, thanks very much. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda um, is appointments. I don't believe we have any appointments this evening. So moving to public comment, is there anyone? Uh, who would like to make any public comment this evening? All right. Not seeing any, I will turn to our last item on the agenda, which is town administrator and select board reports. So Michelle, we'll start with you this evening. Thank you. I have one from the town clerk. I'm just gonna share this notice real quick. She just wants to remind everyone about the early voting dates. So Saturday, is double duty day, she's calling it. Um, it's the last day to register to vote for the primary. Um, and it's the first day to come in for early voting. She also wanted to point out that we have a new ballot drop box at Town Hall. It's right in front of the front entrance of Town Hall near the Veterans Memorial. So for anyone who's um, voting by mail, they can put their ballots in there and also their applications if they want to, to register for vote, uh, to vote. Um, the last day to vote by mail to register for that is Monday, August 29th to submit your application there. And let me just go down really quick. All of this is on the town website, on the clerk's website, and she did an email blast recently and a Facebook post to try to get this information out. Um, but early voting starts this Saturday. Um, it'll be on the second floor in town hall, and then it will there won't be any early voting on Sunday, but then during business hours next week, so Monday through Friday, um, we'll be doing early voting here as well, ahead of the actual primary, which is Tuesday, September 6th. The polls will be open that day from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And she just wanted to remind folks that the precincts did change a few months ago. Um, so she's you know, asking folks to double check their address online to make sure that they're heading to the right location. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Any questions for Michelle? Joe? Nope. nope. Liz? No questions. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Okay. Let me turn to Art. Sure. Good evening, uh, Bill and members of the of the board. I just have a couple of updates to share. First, uh, I'm pleased to announce that the uh, LED lighting retrofit supported by the uh, Green Communities grant that we uh, received in the fall of 2021 is moving forward here in the town hall complex, having started uh, um, uh, early last week. We're really excited to see uh, progress made in the installation of over 500 uh, LED uh, light fixtures in all of uh, the, the town hall complex serving town facilities, school department, senior center, as well as uh, some rec department lighting. Uh, it's been a long time coming. The uh, supply chain issues have clearly been resolved and uh, the project's rolling forward. We're expecting the project to be completed in early October. We also want to report that uh, the RFP for a sustainability coordinator has been released, is, is now posted on our website. Uh, as of this writing, we've had uh, at least 25 different legitimate organizations take a look and download the RFP. So we're pretty excited about that. We've had an opportunity to push it out, push this opportunity out into the uh, clean tech community and sustainability community by a number of different uh, avenues and I'm optimistic that uh, we'll have some quality options to consider when the, when the uh, RFP responses are due on August 29th. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Any questions from uh, any members of the board, Liz? No questions, thank you, Art. 
Joe. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Let me turn to Tom. Great, thank you, Bill. I'll be quick. Just a couple of uh, quick thing, quick items. We heard from Bill Hardigan uh, earlier tonight. Um, we I wanted to announce that he's actually in the final stages of um, of building out the new IT server room. That's a project that was funded by town meeting about two years ago. Um, we got all the work in. The contract has been here, laboring down the hall for months. Um, and it, I'm proud to announce it actually looks like an IT room and not a closet in an old school that we put a bunch of computers in, which is great. <laughs> uh, it's a nice functional professional IT space uh, for, for our servers, which is what we need. And I also wanted to point out that when the pub, if the public safety facility is supported by town meeting and when that gets built, the IT space in that building will serve as the backup for and the redundant uh, redundant site for all of the town's IT infrastructure. So, um, which is a great, you know, it'll be a nice uh, backup and, and redundant tool for the town. So look forward to having that built, uh, should we get there. And then lastly, just I, I announced last week, we had our second uh, um, video released last week. Today, we just released our third video uh, in our program for to educate the public on all things uh, related to the fall town meeting. Today was the second in, of, of two, uh, explaining some information to do with the public safety facility, featuring our very own David Jones and Chief Murphy. Um, next week, we will begin a two-week session, a two-week program with the school department to talk about um, the foster school. So those will be released uh, next week and then the following week after that. That's it. Tom, thank you very much. Well, uh, any questions for uh, Tom, Joe? No, no questions. Liz? No questions. Thank you for doing the videos. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, we'll turn to uh, select board reports. Um, Joe, anything to report tonight? Nothing to report. Um, I just uh, noticed how many events that uh, we are anticipating over the next couple of weeks um, in Hingham, you know, the Sunset Concert with the reggae band. Um, we, there's just so much happening in town. Uh, it's just incredible to see the spirit that's uh, alive in Hingham. Um, and I just want to, Michelle, the presentation you gave this, this evening was really excellent, so thank you. Uh, but I've got nothing to report. Thank you, Liz. Nothing to report, thank you. All right, and I have nothing to report as well. So with that, I would take a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor by roll call. Joe. Aye. Liz. Aye. And I'm an eye as well. 